Coffee. Yep. All right. Ready, Scott? Yep. All right. We got Casey back in again, man. Thank you so much for always coming in. Always uh, a pleasure. Meal Prep 101, Fire Department, and all kinds of other stuff that we won't discuss right now at the all moment. The place, but yeah. yeah. So when I always see the Meal Prep 101, I always think it's like a delivery, but it's not a delivery. No, I, I've actually, I started off uh, in 2014, um, I started off creating my own meal prep company with a business partner, and through that experience, one of the things that we learned was there's nobody out there. It was such a novel industry. A lot of times, I always tell people when we would go to open up a bank account or anybody we spoke to, merchant processor or whatever, they had no idea what the business model was. There Now everyone knows what meal prep is. You order the food, comes delivered, you know, healthy, nutritious meals, heat and eat, you know, it's, it's everywhere. But 10 years ago, it was so new that not only did I have to explain it to everybody, but there were no real resources. If I want to start a business or if I want to start a, a restaurant, there's, you know, restaurants have existed forever. So there's tons of restaurant resources and software and consultants but we experienced growing florida's highest rated meal prep company that we had to basically figure out everything on our own um, even when we reached out to other meal prep companies to just form alliances and kind of like share battle scars and strategies and tips and everything like that everyone was really reserved and they were very protective of um, what they were doing or what they knew why it, I think it's just competitive nature. People, I think, uh, default to a mentality of scarcity. Like, there's not enough. If I tell you one of my tricks or something I've learned, somehow that's going to hurt me. But with, I mean, in, in certain products, that makes sense. If we're selling yachts, there's only so many guys who are buying yachts. Maybe I'm not going to share my client list with you or how I find clients. But when the product is food and everybody literally eats food, <laughs> I didn't see any scarcity. So we used to actually reach out to other meal prep companies as we got bigger and we would help them out. Even when we picked up um, our commissary, we have a 6,000 square foot facility that we got in Boca. Um, and when we got that, we didn't need it. So we even, not not all hours of the night and week, we didn't have production going on. So we were even renting out some of our time, uh, you know, like as a commissary to uh, other meal prep companies. And they're always like, why are you doing this for us? And it's just like, you know, it, why not? You know, it's it's offsetting our rent and, you know, we can teach you some things. And like I said, at the end of the day, nobody would ever, you know, look at, you know, oh, there's too many restaurants out there. Like if I told you I had a restaurant idea, you wouldn't think like, oh, there's so many. I don't think you can, you can, you know, sell any more food. So we looked at it the same way. I started uh, on YouTube in 2019, really just trying to learn how YouTube worked and learned about video production and all that kind of stuff, just out of, out of curiosity. As you know, I'm, I'm all over the place, always trying to dig into stuff. And a lot of times I'll, I'll start off by going, I wonder how this works without any intention behind it and then end up doing it. Like I, I did an NFT project and it all started with, I wonder how NFTs really work. Like how do you get it onto the blockchain? How do you get the image and the relationship and all the security? So I ended up just going down a rabbit hole and within like two weeks I created an NFT project doing a <laughs> bunch of uh, all-nighters and stuff. But that's how it started with, the consulting aspect, which is what mealprepbiz101.com ended up being, was I start off on YouTube, just putting out content, not really any expectations, but just like, here's how we're doing it free to the world. If you want it, you know, here's, I, and I always tell people, I never claim to be an expert, but I always look at it as I'm a sophomore. You might be a freshman. I might not be able to teach you the calculus class, but I've taken it. Here are my notes. Here's, if you got two teachers, this is the better one to take, you know, whatever else. And this is what worked for me. This is what I was able to figure out. This is why this didn't work. And just organically through the uh, YouTube channel, I started getting more and more comments with questions and I was using them to like spark ideas for future episodes. And then people would start asking me about, you know, getting on a phone call and like, oh, I'll pay you for consultation. And at first I was just doing it for free. But because um, I just like talking to other entrepreneurs and, um, you know, exchanging ideas and things like that. I, I genuinely enjoy doing it. Like I was saying before we started, I'm looking to get back into it uh, with. So it's it's grown so much this the last few years that all of my time that I allocate each week because I got to block out my time. I'm like, all right, I got X amount of hours I'll put on this project. All of that became consumed 
instead of content creation and editing, which you know is very time consuming, start getting eat, eaten up by the um, one on one consultations. So this year, last year, I spent a lot of time trying to delegate and automate and make um, a lot of efficiencies to free up my time so I could get back into the content creation aspect of it, which is where it all started. But it was all just organic, just putting up some videos, getting more questions, getting people asking, you know, give me, you know, uh, give me an hour. I'll, I'll pay you 200 bucks to get on a call with me just for an hour. I got these questions. I keep hitting my head on, on the wall. And uh, right now for the uh, the meal prep industry i'm like the consultant like i can't find anybody else i was just on a call yesterday with a girl and she's like you're the only one out there doing it some people have put up a little bit but they barely have a real business going they're like doing a you know 100 and something meals a week and i can't learn from someone that that's that's that small and you know scaling to thousands and thousands and uh, making a much bigger business it, you see a lot of different aspects of the business and you just have different perspectives that you just don't you can't see around the corner when you're dealing with a few dozen clients versus getting into the realms of hundreds and thousands. So yeah, um, that's pretty much how it started and it's a, a growing industry. It's pretty cool to see how it went from something where I had explained it to literally everybody <laughs> to where now everyone knows what meal prep is. And, uh, I like it because unlike starting a restaurant, someone, you know, I'm always a champion for entrepreneurship. I've always been, you know, been an entrepreneur, always kind of had that mindset, even before I even really saw it in myself. I had, you know, a business mentor kind of tell me it, one day he told me, he's like, the best thing I could do is fire you because you're a great employee, but you're going to be an excellent entrepreneur. And I was like, huh? So that path led to this kind of uh, cool exchange that I get to have regularly with other entrepreneurs, see their businesses grow. And what I really like about this industry is if you were to start a restaurant, there's a lot more capital that you need to make up front, a lot of investment and hiring and, and planning that has to be done before you even open the doors and have your first client. Whereas with meal prep, you're providing a need to everybody, like I said, everybody eats. So you're able to provide this need that's a benefit to the client, something they appreciate. It's an awesome business, a really fun service to, to, to be in, but you can also start it at a much smaller level with literally a handful of you know clients and a lot of them i just tell them like you don't know where to start tell your friends what you want to do and i'm sure you'll have enough of them to at least support your initial you know amount of volume like we we're literally profitable our first week with 10 clients just from our small circle and then you can scale it and i have some clients who find a happy medium where they've got a nice life balance they don't want to make it a multi-million dollar company they're happy where they're at they make you know good six-figure income control their schedule love their business have great great relationships great relationships with their clients all the way to people who are trying to you know blow it out of the park and you know get to the you know millions and millions of dollars of revenue so it's it's cool because it's it's that adaptable where you know like i said entrepreneurs who want to start a lot of different types of businesses it's just so far out of their reach where they'd have to quit their job mm -hmm. and have the money and have the marketing up front and all these other investments just to risk and maybe it doesn't work out where's the meal prep you could start it with uh it, it's much more feasible much more obtainable you could start it faster and it allows you to you know get your feet wet test your idea see if there's traction and a need and and you know real client base there and then you can grow it from there or take it back into the shop, retool your idea, maybe, you know, going for halal vegan in my little area isn't really sustainable. So let me try to tweak it a little bit and find a better model. But um, yeah, it's cool. And you can be creative and, you know, all sorts of different uh, kind of niches that you can target if you want to with it. So and, and they were fighting over giving food information. Like somebody couldn't just figure out that, you know, if you're, if you want a protein diet, you're going to probably eat eggs, protein. And <clears throat> it, it's not so much that, I mean, there is uh, like a lot of times with in the consultation yesterday, this one, this, the, the girl I was speaking to was like, Oh, her chef's going to have problems. Like if, if I give them the recipe, are they going to have an ego problem making my food instead of theirs? And I was like, that's not the problem. The problem would be, when they have a recipe and you want to systemize it so you can scale it. So it's like, okay, you can make it and here's the recipe for 10 of these. But when I hire 10 people under you and we got to make a thousand of them, what does that look like? 
and they get really protective of the recipes. Oh, but when you talk to other business oh, owners where they're going to get protective is like, Hey, what software are you using for logistics? How do you route? How do you, you know, design your routes? Right. How do you pay your delivery drivers? How do you market? You know, like all those little things, um, which it does obviously give me an advantage. But like I said, I, I've never, I've never felt like giving that information out or sharing those secrets have, has ever been a detriment to our business. And now I've shifted where I'm no longer in the meal prep company. I'm doing, I'm still doing the consulting. That's my, my primary focus. Um, I got out of the day to day with uh, the meal prep business in like 2020, gradually phasing out. Cause once you get, you know, 50 employees you get more and more time. So between that's kind of where I started in 2019 was, Oh, I could do this at night when everyone goes home. I'll just stay in the office later and record some video, do some editing on my own time. It was like my own little side passion. And um, yeah, now it's kind of like become this entire avenue. Yeah. And it was completely organic with no like assumption. I saw the need. I wasn't really compelled to be that guy, but I didn't realize how much I knew until I was speaking to other people and saw the questions that they had and it's like man i remember when i was when i was doing that it's so funny because a lot of them i can start predicting certain things about their business just with the initial conversation i'll be like okay so you're probably doing <laughs> taking the orders on a spreadsheet right and they're like yeah and i'm like okay you're probably doing all your billing on one day in one day <laughs> a week manually right it's like yeah it's like i was there i was like i was the first delivery driver i was the first shopper basically everything everyone everyone assumes that i could cook and i always tell them i could cook a little bit now but at the beginning, if you asked me to boil water, I'd burn it. But it was, you know, hiring a chef and learning, you know, even even now it's hard to figure out between chef A and B if you're looking to hire who's better. You know, it's it's such an intangible thing from someone who's not in that industry. It's been cool to see the perspective that I've gained and then the way that I can share that. And like I said, it's it's like giving a freshman my notes. It's like, this is scary for you at this point, and you got a lot of questions, but I got answers for all of this stuff. I've got resources. I've got some tips of stuff that I've tried and it worked. Some stuff I tried, here's why it didn't work. And, um, you know, it's it's cool. I would think, like, now is the time yeah. for it to be lucrative because nobody wants to go to work. Mm -hmm. all, all I hear is nobody wants to work. I can't get people to work. And this is one of those things you can do from home. Yeah. Right? You just go on here. Uh Scroll to a uh, meal, go to a uh, meal prep software on there. So you go in here, you go through it, you sign up, whatever. And then you basically walk the client through how to get started. You know, the best way to do it without selling your house to have a meal prep business and so on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, a lot of it, I mean, it, it, I can, it, what's cool is I, I have clients at a myriad of different levels. Like the girl I was speaking to yesterday, she's actually got a really novel idea that I'm excited to see. I've never seen anybody do it and I'm excited to see it come to fruition, but she hasn't started yet. So she doesn't have a business plan. So I can talk to someone like that all the way to someone who's like, Hey, I'm at 400 clients a week and yeah, we've got, you know, millions in revenue and things look good, but I, how do I get to 800? I'm hitting this, this glass ceiling where I just can't get above 400. I can't scale up the marketing anymore. Uh, maybe I'm not looking at the right marketing avenues. How do I do that? So, um, that's, what's cool is like, I can step in at basically any level that they're at and give them some insight and some tips. And then through the conversation I, I have with my clients, I also see perspectives that they have through different business models that I haven't tried yet or mistakes that I didn't, you know, that I avoided. And it just gives me even more well-rounded uh, perspective so that even when I have someone who is looking to do something like the girl yesterday, I was able to drop a, a lot of knowledge on her that was like secondary, that wasn't personally from me, but I was like referring a lot to. And is oh, she brand new to this? Like never. Completely just, new. Doesn't just have. Just wants like a second job or extra income and rather going to work at, you know, McDonald's or Publix or whatever she could do this instead. So she, so somebody who knows nothing yep. that's looking for extra income or, you know, another job or full time, yeah. they can go right to meal prep one one, and you yeah. can take them through it all to the point. And do you guide them? Yeah. Like, I, you guide I, them, you know, if they're willing to sign up and go with it, you'll guide them all the way to get where they have somewhat of a base. Yep. And then at that point, it's kind of their job to, 
handle it. I mean, if they're fucking up, what are you going to do? Yeah, I, I could step in like the like the coach and be like, you know, the, I told you to do this. You haven't done this. You, I, I told you you got to like make these moves until you put this in place. You won't be able to get here. Um, her her situation right now is she she's an entrepreneur. She's uh, in the beauty industry. She's, you know, doing hair and things like that. She's seeing that that's very difficult to scale. Whereas what I like about this, again, it's it gives you that luxury to scale it. I mean, within reason to wherever you want to make it. Do you want to just make it so that this is a owner operator situation, but you're not, you know, showing up to work at nine, you're working around your own schedule. Cause what's beautiful about this is like, if you do have that side side gig and you're working 40 hours a week, let's say in an office, you can go home and bang the food out at night. You can do it on the weekends. It, it you're since you're delivering it it's not that instantaneous cook and and eat kind of situation where it has to be so immediate and you have to work around the client schedule you have delivery done you know sunday night for monday food delivery and you get the food done over the weekend you can still keep that nine to five job that pays the mortgage and pays for the kids and everything else keeps the light on as you scale into this and it might just be extra income because you got a passion for cooking that you never leaned into i've got you know people who are personal trainers who just felt frustrated that you know i could spend an hour with you giving you the best workout ever but if you're going to go bang out a big mac after this <laughs> it's going to be a detriment to what we're trying to do so they don't necessarily have any culinary expertise or experience but they want to provide something that is you know they meet that need and the way i always look at it is we don't sell food. We're selling convenience. We're selling time because you can get food anywhere. Like I can't put a patent on food or any recipes really. But and I think it like, think how much people spend on Uber. I, I mean, I'm the most guiltiest fucking guy on the planet with this Uber East thing. You're spending $10 more. Half the time it's not right. Plus the delivery. If you want priority, you know, so within that, that alone, I mean, you could save so much money just on this. And, and with Uber, you're paying the upcharge, but it's for convenience because you're not spending the time right. going to the restaurant, picking it up yourself, going to the store, getting the groceries, cooking it yourself. These are all things that we can do. But the average American spends like eight and a half hours every week buying food, cooking food, washing the dishes afterwards. That's right. You got dishes too. That's right. Yeah. That, I love talking to attorneys. They're my best client because they've got the billable hour. <laughs> In this aspect, I love talking to attorneys. Normally, not so much. Um, so for my best friend, John, who's an attorney. Love you, John. But they quantify their hours with the dollar amount. So when you tell them, I'll save you eight hours a week, they're thinking, man, I charge $400 an hour times eight hours a week. How much is this service? Like, I'm making money by buying this from you instead. So it's cool. Plus the health, health aspect, everyone's trying to get healthier. Um, after COVID, um, everyone asked how our business did with COVID because it's like, oh, man, like, you know, the economy took a bit of a hit. With us, we saw this exchange where we did have people dropping off because of, you know, financial uncertainty and, oh, my wife just got laid off or my, my husband had a reduction in hours or whatever. But we also saw an influx of people who – couldn't go out or didn't want to go out so they just got this you know service delivered to them and then once you're on it i always tell people it's like taking you know a tiger or a lion that's been fed steaks every day at the zoo and then you put them out in the wild if you're on the meal prep for like a month and a half and that then you don't put in an order you're like man how did i what did i do before this like i don't have food just magically in my fridge like i gotta I gotta order on Uber Eats, but that's just one meal. What do I do for the next meal? Oh, I gotta go out to Publix and shop and cook. Man, it seems like such such a pain. And you kind of got used to that steak being fed in your cage every day. You kind of miss it. So, like yesterday, I got two wraps, two fucking grilled chicken wraps, and it was forty dollars delivered. And I just happened to look at how much it was for not because of this. Just I just looked, and I'm thinking, wow. Forty dollars for two wraps. Yeah. If I just drove there, it would maybe be sixteen nowadays. Like, and, and we don't think about it because you know so a quick. lot of times we think in short term and we're just thinking oh. about that meal and it's just one expense and one expense. And then you look at it after a week or a month and you're like, man, that credit card bill has a lot of Uber <sighs> showing up on there. <laughs> I, I, I looked and I go, whoa. Well, and then you go Uber East and you say, oh well. I'm already doing Uber Eats. I might as well do Instacart too, because I don't want to go to the fucking grocery store. So now you got, you know, before you know it, you're dropping 500 a week just on convenience. Yeah, yeah. Now, like these, I because I had a couple of these sponsors, but like Hello Fred, they change their names a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, they change their names a lot. But now, how do they do it? Uh, there, there's a few that are out there. So there's we won't say the. I mean, I don't know if you want to say the name. 
what? How do they do it? Where they're sending a box of shit all over the country, and it's delivered, and those are your meals, and blah 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 blah. Like, so how do the the monsters do it? The same way? Yeah, very sim, uh, very similarly. They just uh, at a larger scale. So they'll have multiple f- production facilities that'll service a certain geographic area. A lot of times, they're going to work through a hub like Atlanta, and they'll hit certain states so they can, you know, have that uh, that logistics chain go from you know production facility to the airport delivered somewhere in a distribution center put in some vans and then sent out Uh, there's also meal kits which um, you know got on they they got kind of popular a few years ago but the problem with that is they're just sending you the ingredients and a recipe which which is fun for a date night but fuck that the convenience isn't fully there you're just getting the groceries into my house and i still gotta cook it you know after working all day and taking the kids karate and all that other jazz I I hear a lot of people, they'll start with that because they're like, oh, I'll learn to cook and it'll be fun. It's like, it's fun for the first one. But a lot of people, when they quit those, you'll ask them why. And they're like, I ended up having, you know, three or four of them in my freezer because I didn't have the time to do it. And I just see them piling up in my freezer and I, it was just a waste of money. There ain't nobody cooking right now. There's nobody cooking. These guys, these people have, I mean, three minute attention span at best yeah. yet yet alone fucking put something on a pan and cook it it's yeah. not happening yeah i mean maybe some older guys but i don't see it happening but when they do that they sh- i what i don't get is how is it fresh because it comes in a cardboard box with, with cold shit and if it's delivered at one and say you don't get home till nine it's out there all day. Then you're taking out that lettuce and everything else. That That's one of the big Some dangers. shit, Scott. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Fiji. More than just water. This is not just rock. It's ancient volcanic rock that filters tropical rain, giving it double the electrolytes and its signature soft, smooth taste. It's not just water. It's Fiji water. This podcast is brought to you by Monster Energy. Tear into a can of the meanest energy drink on the planet, Monster Energy. It's the ideal combo of the right ingredients in the right proportion to deliver a big bad buzz that only Monster can. Monster packs a powerful punch, has a smooth, easy drinking flavor. Athletes, musicians, co-eds, road warriors, metalheads, geeks, hipsters, and bikers dig it. You will too. Monster Energy is more than just the green OG. Monster has Monster Ultra. Juice Monster, Monster Hydro, Rehab Monster, Dragon Tea, Monster Max, Muscle Monster, and many more. Buy on Amazon, buy on Walmart, or go to MonsterEnergy.com and believe me, you'll find a place. Unleash the beast, Monster Energy. Yeah, that, that's one of the big dangers, and that's if the delivery, you know, hits you the first time. If they hit yeah. your building and it stays in the truck, they got to put cold elements in there, whether it's, you know, dry ice, so they normally do some cold packs. Um, they'll use a uh, map. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can do it, but a lot of them will use, especially the national guys and the guys who are going across state lines, they'll use uh, map sealing, which is modified atmospheric uh, packaging or something. It's basically that, that cellophane seal that you see it yeah. sucks out the oxygen because the oxygen is one of the things that, um, you know, will lead to the uh, expiration of the food. So they suck the oxygen out, replace it with, you know, something inert like nitrogen and then seal it. So theoretically, it can last. Fresh is a very flexible term because it might be a two-week-old meal, it might right. be two weeks since it was cooked. But you know, it's like lean cuisine or something like that. It's you know frozen, so it's still it's definitely still edible and it hasn't been deteriorating. But fresh is like I said, it's until you look at the flexible. back of that lean cuisine with seven thousand milligrams of sodium yeah. in it, so that they can freeze it and keep it preserve it. Yeah, you know, fun stuff. Yeah, but. When I was looking through it, because I always forget that it's not, you know, you're not Hello Fresh. Yeah. You know, this is how you do Hello Fresh yeah. or something like that on the side and a good hobby. And I don't know why all these people looking for a job aren't flying to this right now. And I mean, you're going to make more doing that, I would think, than a job that's going to tax the hell out of you, give you your hours and fuck up your day. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it's not for everybody, um, but for those who are interested in doing it. The one thing I've, I've had a, a bunch of different businesses and the meal prep was the most fun I had had up to that point. I would even say um, even even more fun than consulting 
in the uh, aspect of you know being able to be face to face with people, go out to events and do dem- demos, have them try the food right there, get the reaction, um, getting the feedback when people call in and just you know talk about you know they gush about how much of a life save it is and how great the food is and how their kids love you know the the mahi fingers that you know we're now cooking in a more health conscious fashion but we're they're telling their kids that they're chicken fingers <laughs> it's just like i got <laughs> my kid eating game, fish yeah. as long as i keep telling him it's chicken fingers yeah. he's eating the mahi um so yeah that that that's one thing that's cool and you're able to it's definitely a, a big relationship based business so the, the national companies i can't imagine how they'd be able to scale the customer service to the quality that we had but when we started off we intentionally made our company we wanted to fill a void that we saw where we wanted to do intentionally more expensive meals. We wanted to go for the higher end clientele who wanted larger portions. They wanted top quality ingredients. We never had tilapia on our menu where you see a lot of the other meal preps. And, and that's fine. Some some do that, you know, but it's 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 just that business model that we wanted to do. We want to be the Nordstrom as opposed to like the Walmart. And there's plenty of Walmart clients out there and that's fine. But a lot of people are competing to be the cheapest and it's just harder to provide quality and quality feeds retention when you're trying to be the cheapest and you're fighting around with pennies and trying to get creative. When we're able to be more expensive, but you see that quality in the food, and it wasn't that much more expensive. It's still going to be cheaper than Uber Eats and, and those those type of uh, options that you'd have. I'm able to have better customer service agents. I'm able to have a smaller client base that's more profitable so that we can spend more time with fewer people having quality conversations building relationships especially like we started off you know locally just in palm beach county then it grew to palm beach and broward then we added dade and then martin county and uh, but initially it was just having those relationships where it's like oh i go to that gym oh do you know you know joe drake yeah he he's the owner and trainer there yeah yeah i know joe oh he's the one who told you about the food yeah we're going to be doing an event there next week i'll see you there shake some hands and and have that personal interaction relationships are huge and it was so much fun and we were able to be silly with the business where you know the businesses i've had before one of them uh, i built a nationwide network of attorneys we're dealing with you know legal stuff and a, a nationwide network of attorneys yeah oh yeah, we still have 48 <laughs> oh goodness. states. And that's that's not as fun. You can't crack jokes. With, with, uh, with I was going to ask you how much Klonopin or Xanax or marijuana you took during that time period. Dealing yeah. with that bullshit? It, oh, it, and God. It's, yeah, you're, you're dealing, it's like being a cop. You're never you know dealing with people. You pull them over, they're never having a good day. With meal prep, they're having a good day. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, no attorneys easy. having a good fucking you're day. Able to joke. One of the things Payday, I, I, I loved, a great example is... Um, Until they realized the case that they took. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The attorneys are the only ones that are happy. Um, but we would have, uh, we had, I, I hired a uh, voice actor who did Christopher Walken impressions. And when you call the phone number, it would be Christopher Walken answering. And it just there was like one of the options was uh, like you know press one for customer service, press two for this, whatever. One of them was like uh, press, I think four, whatever number it was, is it like press five for a high five over the phone. Uh, one of them was uh, press like four f- to hear uh, a walk-in joke. So you press- yeah, that would sell me right there. If Christopher Walker was doing that, whatever the shit is, even if I thought I was going to get scammed, I would. All right, I'm sold. And it, let and let it, me and, give it a shot. And it 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 builds a relationship, even though you haven't spoken to anybody yet. That first impression is like these guys are hilarious. Yeah, they and, love what they do. And what is the best thing in the world? Laughter. Yeah, right. You can't be laughing yep. with a girl, with business, with a meeting. You make somebody laugh, you got them. Yeah, make them laugh twice, three times, you really got them. Yeah, you know, or at least you can start working them. Yeah, you know, it's a hard thing. But to I, do. I think what's going to happen before they destroy us, I think people are going to see how much they're spending on Uber Eats. And I keep going out, when I do go past dinner or go out to dinner, I ask myself every day, how in the fuck is, are these restaurants still full? Like, how much credit do these people have? Because I don't have any credit left. <laughs> so, I mean, how do these pe- how are they going out to eat? At all? They're all full at night. I think, I think this year we're going to start seeing a lot of uh, the reality set in, a lot of the uh, manipulation that's been going on between... You know, the press and the Fed and all this, uh, even the data that they look at and, and they show us for economics, they're they're tweaking things and they're changing the metrics so that the PCI numbers and things that we would have had using metrics from a few years ago aren't realistic. What's PCI? It's lagging. Um, 
performance. Uh, I forget what that uh, is. Yeah, I forget. It, it's something, something that means something. something. indicator. Yeah, it's kind of like a clicks per minute thing. It's similar to that, but in that yeah, field. Something, yeah, something cost indicator or something. But it's basically like, what's the average rent price? What's the average this, that, and the other? So if they're using delayed data, which they often do, they're looking at yeah. the data from you know, 10, 12 months ago, and they're weighting things differently. Whereas like I heard one metric was uh, even just looking at housing expenses. You know, if they look at the house in you know, 1950 or 1960, the cost of the house in ratio to the income, well, then they're going to change it and be like, well, the cost of the house that we were looking at, we were looking at a 2,500 square foot average house back then, just using random numbers. Let's make that a 1,500 square foot house. So now it's like a cheaper house. So it's not apples to apples. And then we're going to try and try to tweak the numbers so it doesn't look as bad. I think we're going to see the repercussions because you can only, you know, you can only cheat on your tests so right. long. You can only shell this off so long. Mm -hmm. It's going to hit. Yeah. And then the credit cards are maxed. The banks are out. That's it. And then what and do the you restaurants do? don't have a lot of margin because no. you know food costs what it costs, gas costs what it costs, and everything is up. We saw the whole egg debacle yeah. and gas and everything. So and I think Uber and Uber Eats and that Uber guy went. He's going all electric. I was just on going all electric when it's impossible to go all electric, and they just had the thing in with the cold. Yeah. So I think I think Uber's fucked. I think Uber Eats is fucked because I talk to some of the drivers and they don't make anything. Yeah. And every time there's an increase, there's an increase, you know, for Uber, which then is a less increase for the driver. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon it's like, and who's tipping now? You know, if you're up in the price for the food. Before, when you'd be like, oh, I'll give 20% like a restaurant, I know some people just go zero, you know, left and right. So I think this this kicks in before we're ended. Yeah, and if you look at a lot of that, I mean, luxury expenses are going to be the first ones that we trim. We've seen it in other economies, so it's going to be less people going out. If they're not going out, then they need Uber less. So a lot, it's, it's going to cascade through a lot of different industries, and I think it's going to be this year because... Uh, historically, when you look at, um, I've got these graphs that I'm, I'm always looking into like financial stuff and economics, and it's one of the little rabbit holes I like diving down into. There's, there's one graph that illustrates very eloquently that when they stop, uh, when, they, when they stop doing the quantitative tightening, which is when they're raising the rates, and they start going back to quantitative easing, a lot of times that will come right before the recession hits. And they'll there's a, another graph which is really interesting. It, it shows uh, Bloomberg like keywords that they've used over the last I don't know how many years, and they'll talk soft landing, soft landing, soft landing, and then it quickly shifts to recession. So they deny, oh, there's no recession. Janet Yellen just came out last week or the week before. We've achieved soft landing. Watch, they're going to start cutting the rates because they're realizing that people aren't borrowing money because it's too expensive. So how do we stimulate the economy? Let's cut the rates. Rates go down. People borrow more money. That's going to exacerbate the inflation issue that we haven't solved yet. So now if we don't have positive GTP, uh, GDP, we might also put ourselves in a p position like the 70s where we have stagflation, which is high inflation and we're going to have a recession hit. So what are we in right now, Scott? What are we in? We're, we're, we're in a fucked in <laughs> goddamn fucking mud pile. Are we in a depression? Or is this a no, depression? We're not in a depression. We're just in a mess. A recession? Recession? Uh, I don't know, but I look <laughs> I look at the prices of everything and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I, I mean Have you, you seen know, it worse? Never. You never seen it worse than this? No, no. I'm wow. seventy one years old. And you've never seen it no. worse. I, I moved down here a few years ago. Yeah. In the last two years, my HOA for my apartment has gone up 50%. 50%? 50%. Wow. That's a lot of money in two years. Hell yeah. And the reason is insurance, in Florida mm. especially. Yep. You can't get cheap insurance. So I live in a, in a community. The community has to pay overall insurance. Then my building, individual building, they have to pay insurance. Then my individual apartment, we have to pay insurance. So by the time you get done with the three insurance people, you're fucked. I, I mean- What is it with the insurance though? Well, you t talk to DeSantis. I don't know what the fuck's going well, on here. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I know. Well, I, when I moved from Pennsylvania, everybody up north had said, oh, Florida, 
That's the place to go, tax-free. Listen, I'd rather be in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Business-wise, that's all a fucking lie. You come down here and open a business, it might look on paper that it's cheaper. It's not. Because you're getting fucked every by the city, the county, if you have a business. Then this uh, license, then that license. It is cheaper to be in Pennsylvania. I don't know about New York. But I know New, I know PA and Jersey. I take my business there over here any day of the week. This is a fucking racket down here. Yeah, they. I was just talking uh, to somebody. Insurance. Um, the insurance is Jesus crazy. Jesus Christ! It's Can insurance. you imagine if he gets in? <laughs> oh my fuck! Why well, insurance prices to the moon? The the insurance specifically in Florida. I don't know how. I was just. That's uh, why everybody's bitching about insurance. I've heard that a lot. Bro, it's it's wow. it's ridiculously more expensive. I think it's like compared wow. to uh, 2010 averages in Florida. I think some of them they're they're multiple times higher. So 50 percent is is you just know what a short term look. <clears throat> if you right. look over a decade. Remember, I was telling you about Garrett the big time security guard that I, I had in, not security bodyguard security yeah. he was in last week. That's what he was complaining about the whole time that the fucking insurance keeps going through the roof for everything. And he's like, we had to stop some of this. And I'm thinking, dude, you're like protecting like top guy, top notch guys. But like you said, yeah. now imagine being a bodyguard of celebrity people that are dangerous. He said the insurance got so nuts just to be a fucking bodyguard. Like, I don't even, yeah. I didn't even know a bodyguard needs <laughs> insurance. That. Yeah. But whatever it was, it is so high. And then, yet alone to drive that person around in a car. Oh, my so God. So he had to get, <laughs> like, he's more than a bodyguard. So I don't want to make it sound like he's just some big guy bodyguard, but he protects people. Yeah. So he's got to get, like, insurance on himself to protect you. Then, whatever car that he's transporting you in, that's another insurance hike. And he kept saying, insurance, insurance. And I'm like, that's the problem? Uh, I'll give you an example. Now I know. I'll give you an example. When I moved here, I had insurance in New York with Geico, okay? It was like 1600 a year, a year. I come down here, I call Geico, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> I move to Florida, give me the rate, 1600 for six months. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah, well, nobody tells you in New York and Pennsylvania and Jersey. <laughs> I'm like, what? Or maybe even Cali out that way that when you come here, there's a lot of shit you better be ready for. Yeah, I'm like, okay, <laughs> so that doubled my insurance for the car immediately. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. It's supposed to be cheaper to live in Florida. I'm, I'm a retired person. I got, you know... Uh, Low income, so you that's know, what's scary. Is they're saying income. for for the housing market, there there might be some you know people who are on fixed income. They're retired, maybe even their house is paid off, and it's going to be their cost of their insurance that's going to be pushing them out of the house. And then where are they going to go? Because now their kid might be renting, or they didn't even they weren't able to afford a house that was big enough. Ask Scott how fun it was selling his house. Oh my god, he got fucking murdered. No, sorry, Scott, <laughs> but and and there, I, I yeah. mean. From the insurance company's perspective, <laughs> uh, especially like I know st the state of Florida is like the worst as far as like, for instance, uh, home uh, home insurance claims in Florida make up 82 percent of the national claims. So the other scams. 49 scams. states, that's the, well, we get we get the hurricanes and then we also have some scammers. Right. Um, so the mixture of the two and then it's hard to and then, figure out. And then this episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Are you the man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels have dropped substantially since the 1980s at about an average of 1% per year. Think about how old your father was when he was born. For example, if he was 30, your testosterone levels could be 30% lower than his. Low testosterone levels can have all type of health effects on men. It can affect your mood, sex drive, memory, muscle mass loss, you name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but it can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available from your secure online account within two to five days. So... If you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash mscsmedia and get 25% off your test using the code mscsmedia. The link is in the description at the top. Not known, I'll tell you. Can't in my community, oh boy. we have older people. It's over 55. So people fall. They're older. They fall. They didn't want to sue the community, but in, in actuality, they're suing themselves. 
Oh. So if you sue the community for $100,000 or $200,000, where do you think that money's coming from? You. It's coming from my HOA. <laughs> and so, then your HOA goes up. That's right. So <laughs> they don't What a even, racket. They don't even realize that they're costing themselves more money. So that's oh, what's going on. shit. Now, yeah. let me ask you this quick, because <clears throat> uh, Peter McCullough, Dr. Peter McCullough, he was in New York doing a big, big thing. And I said, so how is it there? It, you know, is, are immigrants all over the place? Is there riots everywhere? Blah, blah, blah. He was like, I've been here two weeks. So I haven't seen one thing. Like a little bit of protesting, but like what you're seeing on TV, at least when I was there for two weeks, isn't happening. So when you were going back and forth and you got stuck there for a while. Yeah. What is it really like in New York? Like what is it? Is it riots everywhere? Is it people stealing every two seconds? Or are they just showing the bad? It's just uh, it's just out of control. I mean, you know, you, everywhere you go, it, it, it's expensive. Obviously, it's New York, uh, uh, but it's just not safe anymore. Um, the ser- the public services aren't what they used to be. The traffic is insane. They put a a red a, a, a ticket camera, red light camera everywhere, and they put speed cameras even more places. So if you go over twenty miles an hour anywhere in the city. City's big, not just Manhattan. Fifty bucks. Well, they got to pay for all those illegal immigrants. They, <laughs> you know, that he's now screaming, please. I, it, it's really, you know, I've been down here two years. I went up there for last summer, and it was like I wasn't comfortable. I lived there my whole life. I just wasn't comfortable. So I, I you know, it did. It changed. It just. Did you changed. see a lot of protesting or violence? No, I, I lived in a borough, so it was like. Whatever Kinda was going on in Manhattan it. was like, you know, I didn't see a lot of that. But, you know, it just got very, you know, know. It's, it's very it's, c- crazy. It's just not comfortable. It's Go to the uh, third tab. <laughs> yeah. Sad and scary. And they're ruining it. Yeah. And, now, and now you want it to be a, you know, state where you'll take anybody. And now you want to cry about what's going on. Yeah. Uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago the third and one? New York are the, the ones... Leading the uh, the longest. Chicago, that's right. But in he, California, New York, he that mayor at, at least was able to you know muster up the balls to, in some fashion, go against the party. Uh, the Chicago mayor seems like he's more so blaming, you know, no, Abbott sh- and yeah, people. Yeah, for yeah Chicago mayor got a fresh haircut <laughs> and a nice watch. Yeah, they're not I, feeling it. They're, and came on to say he's putting a hundred million ball. into whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see a lot of the uh, immigrants that they're bringing in. Yeah. Just the, just spreading them out all over the place, but it's going to be. There was a building in my neighborhood that they were putting the immigrants into. So you know, I wasn't there long enough to see if anything else went on, but they're putting them all over the place. See, now I would think in New York that the panic would be through the roof because to think that all these people are coming in and there's not, say, one terrorist out of every hundred thousand or half of you know one in that there's got to be one terrorist in every half a million especially when the cartels bringing them over you know you would think that new york would be like fuck but but like i'll give it to you i'm sure you hate adams right i mean he at least he did come up and cry (laughs) i I, am i'm (laughs) cry cry please help yeah i I don't know what's wrong with him (laughs) i'm agnostic about him specifically but i think at, at least I'll, I'll give them the credit for coming up. I've heard a lot of people who live in New York say that they they like him as a mayor. He's a breath of fresh air. He's proactive. Uh, I appreciate the fact that he's willing to you know go against the count, the the party negative uh, narrative. Um, but I mean, like, I don't know how we get back from here because even if tomorrow snap your fingers and close the border, like you said, who got through? And some of them might not come through radicalized and at a terrorist level yet but when they come through and they are met with you know uh the expectations that they you know came here with you know aren't being met or they're met with hostility or you know the locals are frustrated like we're seeing you know people fighting in ireland and and stuff like that it's creating a breeding ground and i i look at it you know going as a conspiracy theorist, like a lot of this stuff is just creating situations where it's a win-win for someone who had a socialist agenda. Cause it's like, Oh, there's, you know, you know, rampant, uh, violence and crime and everything. Oh, we need to increase the government and have more police and more this and more that and more department of blah, 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 and sector of this. We need more government funding. Let's just keep on printing money 
and collapse the dollar or, you know, bring them in and create voters out of them. It, so it in which way are they most likely going to vote? Like I've seen all these videos of um, like I was literally watching videos yesterday where this guy was what podcast was that? He, he went through he and his brother went through uh, the process where they start off in South America and went with the migrants coming in and went like got kidnapped uh, by the cartels at some point and he lost all of it like a lot of his footage I guess he was probably uploading as he went but they're trekking through the rainforest and they got to pay this guy like a coyote here to get him across the river they got to pay this person to lead him through the jungle and they're going through with families with little kids and they're trekking like multiple days through the jungle and he's like you know you got to keep your feet dry because if you can't walk your way out of here there's no help there's no 911 there's none of these people are carrying you out they're they're making a beeline and people are dying. It's like 10K and it all goes to the cartel. Now, before it wasn't. The cartel and the whoever else, you know, like the cartel, they're the ones getting everybody through. So to think that they just get you through and then there's not somebody in the United States that is waiting for you and say, hey, remember, we got you all the way here. Remember. Well, you, you know, it's not over yet. You got to come here. We got to talk to you. You have one more thing we have to, we yeah. need you to do. You, you know, the cartel and gangs like that, or whatever you want to call them, cults, I don't know. Once you give them a dollar, it never ends. Yeah. It doesn't end when you get across that border. And they keep fucking saying, oh, votes, votes, votes. I thought that at first, but this is way beyond votes. That's just some political bullshit. Yeah, that, that's, that's one aspect, but it's a much bigger, yeah. It's what the Soviet, the Soviets called it in the 40s. They did you ever see that? No. Oh, Ari, did you see that? No. Ari, Ari Golakovich, I could ever say his name wrong. And this guy Paul Harvey then reported on it. Oh, Paul Harvey, I know. Yeah, and, and he said if I was the devil, and everything he yes, said yes. is happening. Yeah. You know, let's turn people against each other, have wine with church, have an egg with Easter. You know, create porno, Breaking gambling, up the legal nuclear everywhere. Family, yeah. yeah, break up families and then sneak into the education system mm -hmm. and then sneak into to sports, men and women. And then nobody knows who's a male or a woman. No one knows what education is right, wrong, up this, up that. And now everybody's divided. And what do you have to do? Government, I need you, government. And that's what they're waiting for. Yeah. And then they go, oh, here's a free phone. Here's your rent paid. Here's your electric paid. Here's some eyeglasses so you can, you know, play Government VR. housing. And yeah. just please, you know, we're just going to give you what you need until you die to get rid of you because you're just wasting our time when we have AI come in and take over. Yeah. I mean, because you've got these guys that think they're God. George Soros, he's he's a sick motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Just hearing his uh, that 60 Minutes, uh, I think it was 60 Minutes, the, the interview he did where he's discussing how he was, you know, and I, and I understand in those circumstances it's all about survival, but he went around with, like, his godfather and tried to pretend that he wasn't a Jew, and one of the things that they were doing was, like, possess like repossessing the property of the Jews who were going off to the Holocaust. It's like, those are your people, and you had... The even if that was something that you just did as a child because that was a means of survival, there was something in you that had to be capable of that or was changed to be capable of that. And it's not like it just goes away and you all of a sudden get your moral fortitude and integrity back after those circumstances. Like it opens you up to a certain level of decision making that you're comfortable with. And now you happen to have more money than anyone. <laughs> you happen to have, you know, you're the top three in the world with the most money. And you have some problems. And then you got Larry Page, who owns Google, who doesn't even call it artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence. He calls it artificial God intelligence That's on crazy. 60 Minutes. So him and Soros are fucking nuts and have the money to do all of it. Then you got the Black Rock and the whole fucking rabbit hole. Yeah. But did you see this? Did you see this, Scott? No, I just saw it now. How could this happen? How, this is wild. Yeah, this is really a really legal weird. tunnel under New York City synagogue that stabilizes nearby buildings. Official stat say. Scroll down, Scott. Scroll down. Just scroll down. Like scroll down all the way. Down. You got to scroll with the the mouse with your fingers. Oh, you don't know how to use. See, that's where you don't know how to use this mouse. All right, tell me the time on there. Scott forgot his mouse. What's the time on the audio? 50. 50 minutes? 
Okay. You take two fingers. You got to remember your, your Windows mouse. Two fingers to scroll down. There you go. Now you got it. Where do you want to go? All right. Do you want to maybe try using the trackpad? All right. Go back up. Scroll. No, no, no. Just scroll up. Here, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. it. All right. Now scroll up and down. You got it now? Yeah. Okay. Go back up. Down. Down. Up. Scott, I got to read the fucking thing. Never let him do anything unless he has a Windows mouse. No. <laughs> Howard made him use Windows. Yeah, right. You guys never used Mac, did you? Never. Never had a Mac. Even at the end? No. Wow. His choice? I'm going to cut this, so don't worry about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, and he's he don't talk. So. <laughs> I don't... It, I, it was the company's choice. Not his choice. Not any... It was like whoever the engineering heads were, they decided. That is the only sound person I've ever met in my life. And I, I've had some... Big sound guys, not as big as you, that didn't use Mac. Well, I used, I, I did use a Mac on my own in Pro Tools because I know how to use Pro Tools and I used a Mac. So I know how to use a Mac. It's just been a few years since I used a Mac. Yeah, I'm not breaking your balls. I know. <laughs> I just did it. All right. So uh, I'll cut it there. Yeah. Okay. Lead, uh, go ahead. Okay. The illegal tunnel discovered under a historic yeah, Brooklyn wait, 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 synagogue. Wait. You want to pick that up again so you have a clean edit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Scroll, say scroll down and then. Okay. Scroll. All right, scroll down a little bit, Scott. You got it. Okay. The illegal tunnel discovered under a historic Brooklyn synagogue compromised the stability of several structures surrounding the religious complex, prompting an order to vac vacate, as well as citations against its owners, city officials said. Inspectors with New York City's Building Safety Agency uncovered a tunnel that was 60 feet long and 8 feet wide beneath the Chab the Latovich Global Headquarters in Crown Heights. It's connected to four buildings owned by the Hasidic Group through... Hasidic. Hasidic. What is it? Hasidic. Hasidic. Okay, can you read the rest of this? Because you seem to know these words. Oh, you want me to read it. Uh, Hasidic Group through openings and in, cut into basement walls. The excavation work was done without the approval of the Department of Buildings Agency spokesman, blah, 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 said in an email. The Associated Press on Wednesday he said the tunnel was empty except for dirt, tools, and debris. Now, now go down. Go, go down. So what the fuck were they doing? I, I've heard multiple explanations. One that uh, they're, they're saying is it was blamed on like a, a radicalized group of, uh, I guess there was a former rabbi there who had some radical ideas, and one of his, one of his desires was to expand the the center, um, the, the building or whatever, the facility. And I guess after his death, some of these guys took it upon themselves to <laughs> make the tunnels. That's, that's what the story is, but it seems, it seems like that might be a cover because some of the buildings that it was going under, the way that they were. Well, they're saying the guy that constructed it was, is the Messiah. What's the Messiah again? Like the, like basically the, like Jesus, but the Jews, since they don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, they're still waiting for their Messiah. Oh, shit. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's a weird, there's a bunch of stories. I've, I've seen videos of them taking out, like, bloody mattresses and stuff, and then I've seen people saying that never happened, and it's just rumor. It's like, dude, those are videos that we saw with our own eyes. How are you going to say that, that you're bloody just hoping I... Yeah. Okay, so tell me what you think is going on with all this. <sighs> The, the speculation with conspiracy theories and stuff like that, now there's a lot of stuff that's come out about, you know, how, like, the Catholic priests with the kids, mm -hmm. were, you know, and the, that was all protected by the Catholic, uh, you know, the, the Catholic Church moving them around, supposedly. Hey, Paul Harvey said that, too. What's that? That the priests were going to start touching kids. Harvey said that in, like, 60s or 70s. Yeah. It, was, it was probably already going on. It was just going to be publicized. And now there's... there's uh, guys who grew up in the um, Jewish community, specifically in this area, and I guess other places as well, who are basically reporting the same thing, where like the, the rabbis were molesting them and all sorts of other stuff. So some mystery hidden tunnels might be a perfect you know, location to conduct that kind of stuff. I think there's parts of it that go under or parallel to uh, children's centers and wo women's centers in those areas. Because from my understanding, like those, a lot of these Jewish communities, it'll be like kind of like Chinatown, where like everybody from that culture moves into that area 
So it's, you know, protected. They like keeping their secrets. They don't want critiques and, you know, rumors to be, you know, spread from the outsiders. So they keep it within, you know, their, their culture and they kind of hide stuff just like, you know, the Catholic Church did. And they think it's, um, you know, toxic to get out. And it's like one instance at a time. And it's, let's hide this one. Let's hide this one. We don't want, you know, the stereotypes to be developed. But there's a lot of people who are coming out and they're basically saying, you know, parallel with my experience and all these other people's experience. Now these, you know, weird, you know, tunnels popping up. It's, I don't, I don't understand. And I, and I don't understand how whoever was in control of that building was unaware of it. Cause where did the dirt go? How'd they move the dirt? Was it like Shawshank Redemption where they're walking out with pockets full of dirt and walk in the yard? That, that's what I mean. I mean, you're not talking about a ditch. No. Right, you're talking. I mean, just what we know is what sixty feet long, or which With, I'm sure it's much longer. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's a construction job. That's that's a lot of time. Yeah, that's a fucking. That's a blowout. Don't you have to yeah, blow the fucking wide. a hole? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, eight feet wide, sixty feet long. Yeah, that's like the fucking tunnels that, that they're using over there in. That, uh, yeah, that's uh, a long tunnel. <laughs> And there, there's been a move to like immediately seal them off and fill it in and not allow More thorough investigations and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's, it's weird. And so then, wait, they're not going to investigate it? I think, I think there's <laughs> been Jeez. officially there's been an investigation, but it seems like there's been like immediately it's, it's, as, it's, as soon as I heard it. Look at the bottom. It said nine people were arrested, including some who used crowbars to rip off the synagogue's wood paneling. According to police report, so it looks like they did some kind of investigation. And at first, they were trying to say that it's only been there for like six months, and then there was some story about, oh well, they did this because of COVID. They wanted to be able to get to and from the building during the COVID lockdowns, and it's like, well, you just said it is only within the last six months. COVID lockdowns were ended well, you, by then. You know, if you search on Brave, Google, yeah. DuckDuckGo, which seems compromised, and the other ones. It wasn't brave. It, it was uh, what is the one we all tour? Tour, yeah. If you use tour, it says like fifteen years, twelve years, twenty years. Uh, I mean, a minute. I mean, I, I mean, mean it, how could no one know? And this guy died in ninety four, so now we're talking thirty years. So to think that that was done prior to, I mean, to think that that was built like after he died to me is insane. They pro they had to. I would think they're right here. They're saying the guy who came up with the construction of it, who died. I mean, fuck. I mean, so even if you do 94, you're talking 20 years. Well, it's 30. 30. 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. Yeah, it's... Uh, how would not? How would the city not know that somebody was excavating under the... You know, how right. far down... It didn't say how far down it was, did it? I no. think it's probably basement level or probably oh, sub-basement because if you're thinking you're going, you know, either direction in New York, you're probably going to be hitting a cellar or a basement, so they probably had to go pretty deep. But don't you have to blow it out, like with dynamite? Hey, if you any hard rock, I mean, I don't know what, what's what's down there, but uh, it... And, and there were... What's funny is I've seen <laughs> stuff on Twitter where or X, uh, where people, people were reporting, you know, hearing... Um, not Hebrew, Yiddish. Some guy's like, I've, I've been hearing Yiddish in my basement, and there's one guy who did a, a post with his old post from forever ago where he's like, I told you I wasn't crazy. Like, he was kind of like, this is the weirdest thing, but when I go in my basement, I hear, like, people talking in Yiddish, and I don't understand how it could be oh, coming through my basement. You found a post by someone who was in that area who was saying they heard this Yiddish a long time ago mm -hmm. that would connect it all to this, da 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 da, da. Yeah. And what it seems is that they were doing the same thing that the Vatican was doing, just in tunnels, Taking kids in, whatever it may be, you got bloody mattresses out, and they were just keeping it quiet, and somehow it got uncovered. Yeah, and it's and it's Oof. it's bad because it, it it you know people who well, it's not really the time to uncover that. Yeah, and yeah, no especially war. with what's going on, and then you have like you know they, they could have waited like a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, and it's I mean it's Assholes. it's one of those things that fuels the fire for people there who are anti-Semitic because then they'll just say oh see, and then this is another thing that we could. I, but it's it gets it's very irresponsible and lazy to attribute you know a few people or even you know a large number of people to the rest of the Jewish community. You know they're not all one and the same. It's not you know part of their culture to do whatever nefarious things they may or may not have been doing. 
but that's why this becomes a hot topic and i could also see them wanting to suppress that because it's like let's just get the cat back in the bag before it gets out there too much and let's put a bunch of counter you know inform or misinformation out there and reinforce this narrative so people don't look too deep into this so it's just like but when i see but that when you effort do that right when you do that because I'm, I'm sticking with my guy paul harvey here when you do that and you put and you think oh we better put it in a bag no, we put it out there. We let everybody know about it. Then we put it in a bag so that we can all argue about what's what and then divide again. Yeah. And then then you have the own community dividing. You, you know, now you have two. Now, Scott is the most unconspiracy guy ever <laughs> and has a completely closed mind with most things. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. OK. What? I'm just joking. What do, you, what do you think? How the fuck did this happen? You've lived there. How the fuck did they do this? What is this all about? I have no idea. Give me a guess. <laughs> I don't pay attention. What do you mean? I, I had too many years working. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything else. You didn't hear any tunnels getting blown no, up? No. <laughs> but you never know in New York there's bombs going off every day. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, that's true. It might actually not be that hard because they're always building. Right. Now, where that's located? Do you know where that's located? Uh, that crown place? Crown Heights. I was born in Crown Heights. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Um, is that a so cool? Is what, that what do you what, know about the tunnels? Yeah. What aren't you telling us? <laughs> more in the tunnel. Were you in there, Scott? <laughs> Were you in there? Um, it, it's a very mixed neighborhood right now. It's black and very Hasidim. They're called the very high end religious, very religious Jews. Okay, they're like a cult. They're, you know, they're different than regular Jews. Right. Um, but I mean, there was a lot of. There was a lot of strife in that neighborhood over the years because the blacks and the Jews were always fighting. Oh, it, yeah. So um, I, I don't know how they built a tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how? How could you build a tunnel? I mean, you know, it's just... Uh, unless, you, you know, I, I mean, it's, you want to get real wild. It's construction. It's heavy construction. You need, you know, a lot of equipment, a lot of loud equipment. That, but And then you wonder, well, is it 50 years old? Is it 60 years old? And like you were saying before, New York is... Bedrock. It's yeah. just rock. I mean, so how do you get down unless you go into a subway tunnel somewhere? But but even then, I, I mean, what are you going to take a, take an ice pick and, and pick rock with an ice pick <laughs> yeah. to, to build an eight-foot-wide tunnel? Yeah. I mean, I think you need something to blow it. Lots of time, lots of bodies. I, I heard one report saying that they uh, hired uh, immigrant uh, you know, construction guys to come in and bang out the work after hours. But what's hard now is like, I don't know what news sources I can trust. I just try to take everything in they want, and just make little notes everywhere. And I can hold, you know, contrasting ideas in my head and different narratives. So it's like, okay, CNN says this, Fox says this, Twitter says this, uh, Associated Press says this, you know, what, and I see the, the beautiful thing now, it's you know it's got it's a double edged sword is you know with social media, you're able to see people on the ground whipping their phone out, putting it on TikTok, putting it on YouTube, putting it on Twitter. So you're able to add that into the narrative as well. So while this nicely typed up and very probably approved Carefully. and advertised, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it this says one thing. It's like well, I did see videos that you know directly showed this and then your article is saying that that never happens so do i doubt my eyes or do i maybe not trust your source it said it is uh the attorney firm said that the men said or the attorney Menares says clients may have suffered from a little what the hell is that word nabbit Na naivete naivete the fuck does that mean like they're the na naive naive <laughs> they're naive what do you mean they're naive <laughs> Uh, oh, just, they don't know. Just unaware. Oh, that, unaware. Unaware. Oh, unaware. Unaware. Oh, okay. I'd have like, to say oh, that tunnel know. was had to be built in the 30s. Yeah. It's like, oh, I heard hammering. 30s. I thought it was uh, I think you're drum right. practice. I think it had to be in the 30s because you I, could get away with it. Well, yeah, and then the Jews were hiding it from everybody in the 30s. That's so right. They were trying to get away. So yeah. maybe, but, but then how would building inspections have never found? Uh, I mean, I guess it, if it's, it's paneled not, and... Yeah. You know. uh, yeah, paneled and closed up at, at some point. But in the 30s, I would... Think Jews would be trying to hide, and then you got to think there's yeah, there's no construction anywhere near that that would have stumbled upon it when they're putting in new pipes or you know electric or whatever else. It's like, hey, we're expanding your basement, and we found there's a tunnel like behind it. Like, and back and back and even when I was growing up, like if somebody came to my, we never locked our doors, never our screen doors always out, light the street lights were on. And if somebody came to our door when I was like 10 or 12 and like, hey, you know, 
we have an extra pipe. Do you need it? If my grandpa was there, he'd take anything. Come on in. Here, you got to give me a hand, you know? So if the, I think they did it back then, too, because then you could easily do it. Because they would just be like, hey, we're just down here. You know, we're just fixing something in your basement. Right. Oh, they're patching it up. I think it was more recent because they had, like, I saw pictures of you know, piles of dirt that were still in the... Uh, what looked like a, a finished, I don't know if it was a finished basement that was, you know, uh, subterranean or whatever, but... Um, but it, see, this is where he's smart. He doesn't pay attention, right? right? <laughs> so it, we, it, we look at all the social bliss, media, man. the dirt, the whatever, but logic says there's no way they did it now. You might have shoveled that dirt to make it look like now, and, does, and then it doesn't look like it's been going on for 70 years, but to build that? I'm I'm with the guy that doesn't pay attention. No, I don't pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how could you build it now or within the? There's no so many now. people that would create such noise. I mean, when they were building the extension to the Second Avenue subway, like ten years ago or fifteen years ago, the the people couldn't take it. The noise was so much because they were digging and blowing up with dynamite and everything. How can you dig a tunnel like that without noise? And then throw in nine eleven. Anybody hears a bomb go off, right. they think something, yet alone under them. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think any way that's any fucking time recent. The big question is, will, the big question is, will we hear the truth and what? No. You know? Never. Absolutely not. <laughs> never. You, never. Never get, you never get the truth about anything. Now, if it was <laughs> Trump or Biden, you'd hear it. You'd hear something some way, somehow. But with this, no. You know, yeah. you know we're here for a day, let everybody argue about it. Now, we're all open-minded and cool people, right? But... If you're one of those people that I'm dead set that this is what happened, you're dead set this is what happened, you're dead set, and we were all good friends and watched games together, but now we're all in an argument because we don't agree, and I go, Casey, Scott, you coming over for the game? Don't answer, don't answer. That's what it's doing. Yeah. I guarantee you, and yeah. that's what they wanted, in my opinion. Well, I had a friend that I disagreed with politically, and oh, this boy. friend said, you don't watch Fox? I go, no, I watch CNN. I don't want to be your friend anymore. That's so crazy. I said, what do you mean? I don't want to be your friend anymore. You don't watch Fox. I'm like, okay. Never heard from this person in five years since. That's so crazy. I, I, what, what is that? I'm not going to, because you don't do things that I like, I'm not going to go, I'm not your friend anymore? Yeah, but that this That's is crazy. what they wanted. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is what they they purposely wanted this. I, yeah. I, I, I check them both, all of them out, just like you do. Yeah. I like yeah. to get the take on all of it. The, and, and what, I'm not going to be friends with somebody? Yeah, right. you, that's like saying, like, hey, I'm watching the Dallas game this weekend. You're watching the Buffalo. You're not going to watch it. Oh, we can't be friends. We can't be friends. Like, fucking give me a break. The way I look at it is if if we go back. Uh, hold on, hold on. Don't touch the mic. No, no, I think. Loose connection on that. Cable. It's this thing. Yeah, just fucking with it. Oh, wow, yeah. that was it. No, it's not you. Was it Was it good before that? Yeah, yeah, it's not you. It no, was we got to pick it up. Test. No. Yep. Pick it up from what you started saying. It's Tommy, it's 108. 108? Yeah. The way I look at things sometimes is, you know, if we were to go back in time hundreds of years ago when, you know, I, I'm the king. I've got my subjects. Now, it's a very clear line of dividing the teams of them versus me. I tax them. They all feel it. They all resent me and the nobles and, and the other landowners. Whereas if I could orchestrate something that keeps them divided and focused on the color of their skin, their religious beliefs, the party affiliation, or whatever else, they're going to be so busy fighting with each other that they're not going to be focusing their heat on me. And then you couple that with the idea of like, hey, instead of having one king in power that they can, over their lifetime, focus their animosity at, what if we created a figurehead and we just make them feel like they could switch out the figurehead every once in a while, every four years. We'll let them feel like they have a vote. And they can't be too mad because that guy's only going to be in power for four to eight years. Then we'll put their guy in, and everybody gets to win every few years, and they don't have that buildup of that guy. Even if it's the party, it's like, well, this last Republican was my, pro my problem. The next one's kind of starting off with not a completely clean slate, but he's not that guy that got us into that war that was responsible for those bombings or whatever else. And it just keeps on changing the figurehead where it's like, you know, cycling out. Mickey Mouse is running Walt, you know, Disney World today and tomorrow it's Minnie Mouse and then next term it's going to be Goofy and just keeps cycling it out so that they're not only so divided and fighting amongst each other that they barely pay attention, 
But then when they do fa- pay attention, they have this illusion that there is change and some control through the voting process. And that's kind of how I look at things. And if and it's almost like a, a copy of the religion. Like you make all these religions, so you have all this divide. Mm-hmm. And every war, name one war that religion wasn't involved. Yeah. Every fucking war uh, is about this them, religion. Yeah. Every single one. Mm-hmm. You know? And as you erode religion, you could replace it with a political party affiliation. There you go. You know, it's like, oh, you don't believe in Jesus? No problem. You could be a Democrat. Oh, you know, like now you have something strong that you identify with and everybody who's outside of that is the enemy. I seek having, you know, friends with different cultural backgrounds, um, different political affiliations, and we argue would be a harsh term. We definitely have like heated debates back and forth, but I don't subscribe or identify with my ideas and I keep my mind open to the fact that they are opinions based on the information that I've seen. They've got, you know, I trust them enough that I know their beliefs are based on them being right, uh, them feeling that they're right based on their experiences. And we have different experiences and we can come together and I can appreciate your perspective and see things that are wrong with my opinion, change my opinion, change my beliefs. But if we're just going to put ourselves in these echo chambers, that's where you start seeing these zealots, you know, get built up and it's like doing, you know, detrimental stuff to the rest of the world. And they they use Trump as as just a a, a thorn to divide people. Yeah. Yeah, You know, and, you know, Biden's ran this country into the fucking ground, but it's not Biden. It's whoever is calling the shots behind Biden. He's Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. And with Trump... You know, there's a lot of shit with Trump that, like, why why hasn't he come out about the vaccine? He knows. He fucking knows damn well what that thing does. But where did he, Where did Ivanka go? Where'd he go? Where'd Jared Kushner go? Where'd that $900 million go from Pfizer? I haven't seen either of them. Have you seen either of them? They were on, on TV all the time. Yeah. Trump's done. COVID's done. Where the fuck are they? And... Trump's biggest move could come out and say, Biden, you're still pushing this vaccine. You know LeBron James' son almost died because of it. You know Daryl Hamlin, the football player, almost died from it. You know Peter McCullough went to put the chest vest on him for his game. You know this. So why don't you come out and hit Biden that he's still pushing this shit? Why? Because you're involved with it somehow. You have to be. That could be a huge move, but he doesn't. You went to every pharmacy, his war on drugs. And those, these are just the things that I know he did that are never addressed. He made every pharmacy get this particular card reader to scan your ID. It had to be this one and only this one. And if you didn't have it, you couldn't sell prescription drugs. And he ran out a lot of mom and pop pharmacies because they couldn't afford that one slider. Now, in business, great move, right? You monopolize, you have to buy this one. But when you're president and you're trying to do a war on drugs, you don't go to a mom and pop and say, you have to buy this one machine for seven grand or you can't run business. Why, you know, I don't understand why these questions aren't asked. But you ask them about, you know, are you going to be a dictator? Are you going to do that? Like, ask them real shit. And Biden, they just ask, what's on TV tomorrow? Or how was the weather? I, I would love to see... Rogan or I mean Rogan I think would be the best do a long form interview with Trump I know he said he wasn't going to do it and now it sounds like he might he's fist bumping him at, and shaking his hands at the UFC that would be interesting to see somebody beyond what Fox is going to you know if CNN is going to give him all the hard questions Fox is going to give him all the easy questions and they're going to have a 15 minute snippet that we're going to get 30 second you know audio clips from. I'd like to see him sit down for three hours with somebody who I feel is maybe not completely unbiased, but the most unbiased with the combination of a platform and the freedom to not have to worry about what sponsors he's going to upset or whatever else and just sit down and hit him with questions from both sides because we've never seen that from... But but Rogan's good, right? But Trump's better. How are you going to get something out of Trump? The, and that, that'd that be the one thing. Rogan's is, not good enough. I, I think he's at least, I've seen him an, uh, pry enough. I don't know how he would Trump, act with think Trump. Think about Trump. 
That, well, that no, would he be the would thing. pry, but Trump knows how to answer it a tiny bit and then quick spin it. And he'd have to have like a cutoff button. So like when Trump just starts, oh, good question. You asked me about this. Let me start talking about this. He'd have to cut him off. Be like, oh, Mike's dead. Go back to answering that. Never do it. So that three hours would be trying to pry at him, maybe get one or two things. And the one or two things that he got out of him would be the one or two things that Trump knew he was going to let out. You're not going to break him. He's too good. Trump's, he ain't going (laughs) to, it's just going to be a spin and and Trump is going to sit there for three hours like I would if I was Trump. And I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. You don't. You know, Rogan's the go-to podcast, but you're not fucking with Trump, man. I mean, he, he would like be, him or not, I mean, you're be just the not best, getting out of him what you want. He'd be the best chance that I can think of of anybody who'd interview him and have any kind of hope to pin him down on something, but I I wouldn't guarantee it either. I think you're right. And I don't think his lawyers would let him do it. Because he's got four indictments, another one hanging or five, however many he's got, he goes on Rogan and slips, not even about political shit, just whatever those judges were looking for. He'll walk out of there after three hours with six more indictments, you know, <laughs> fucking chewing gum or something or throwing gum on the street as he walked out. Yeah. Or something. They, today they were saying he has uh, syphilis on his hands. <laughs> Yeah, I see. did you see that? I saw it. It was actually on CNN. They said something about his tiny little curled up hand. I, no, it, it was this. Oh my God, what's his yeah, name? Yeah, he had some bald headed like, guy. Sores. Had yeah. glasses. He was saying, "God damn it, I can't remember his name," but he was saying that yeah, he had sores and that it's syphilis. I didn't know you could get syphilis on your hand. That's like the thickest yeah, really. skin on your. Yeah, I mean, get the fuck. <laughs> I saw that on Twitter, but I immediately dismissed it because of who it was coming from. Some people are like, oh, that's from playing golf. And I have no idea. I've never seen that type of, and there's multiple of them. I don't think he's cooking, so I don't think they're No, you know, I, don't think, I don't think he has from, time to cook going from indictment to fucking, you know, whatever it may be. And speaking of golf, what is going on with golf? Live or whatever? I, These guys are signing $600 million deals, and I think Iran's behind it, right? Uh, no, it's not. It's uh, Saudi Arabia. So, oh, jeez. <laughs> Nothing to worry about there. No, no. No, I was just throwing <laughs> $600 million out of nobody like it's fucking... They're just paying off everybody. And they you can't. know about that? Uh, I I know. I've, I've heard some chatter about that, and I heard that uh, I think uh, Trump's team was getting some flack because i think some of his golf courses are signing the deals or whatever else um yeah they're, they're but they they've got so much money right now because of all the oil and i think that they see the trend shifting away from oil so they're looking to reinvest very aggressively and make their value to the world something else like i i know like their soccer team they're giving them ungodly oh, that's right crazy yeah. numbers they're giving everybody like a rolls royce cullen for joining the team. like all these crazy because they just have that crazy money fucking oil money and they're able to make that investment that doesn't make sense right now but it's like <laughs> oh it makes sense long term <laughs> they think long term man they, you see, they paid what's his name 600 fucking million they all these golfers there's a, that big fight for the last couple of years because a, a lot of them left the pga tour to go to play with this live golf and they're all fighting amongst each other now. Now there's almost nobody left in the PGA. <laughs> so they're all going to take the big money. Even the guys in the beginning who said, I could never go over there and take their money. Now they're going over there yeah. and taking yeah. their money. You start writing $500 million. Right. That, yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, Jack uh, Nichols. Oh. Nichols. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's got a price. I didn't think he would go. No, he did. He did? He did. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Wow. Yeah. They're, well, They're all going. Well, I mean, can you blame him? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, you're coming with money like that to hit a golf ball. Yeah, that's generational Shit. wealth. You're, <laughs> he doesn't, you know, Jack Nicklaus don't need to worry about a shirt anymore or no. Macy's deal. That's all over. You do right with that, and your your family will have money so long that they won't even remember who Isn't it came that from. Unbelievable. Whether you like Biden or whatever, just the situation that's going on. Saudi Arabia, golf. Maybe. Golf is like the American fucking shit over here, and Saudi Arabia is yeah. about to own every That's fucking right. player. And then soccer is the biggest sport in the world, yeah, or football, what they call it. And they're fucking throwing what ridiculous money at those guys, like yeah. crazy money. Well, it, they're doing it here. I mean, uh, the Dodgers just gave Otani six hundred, seven hundred million dollars. Seven hundred million dollars for ten years. How, I, I'll never. Run. How does MLB afford that? Especially even now, 
Well, the Dodgers are owned by an independent company. Oh. They're not owned by one person. They're owned by a conglomerate. That's right. AJ was... So, a, do you know... Do you ever meet AJ? No. So, AJ Bright helps with events for the podcast, but he also manages Magic Johnson when he's down here and Rodman and all them. And he was telling me about that deal. Yeah, that was... Yeah, that's wild. That's crazy. Real wild. But that's what they did. They... Because uh, Magic, remember, he bought him part of him, yeah, and then he brought in investors, like from out of the country, not not ones trying to kill us, but <laughs> investors with money. Yeah. So now they, I get it now. He said now they can just fucking throw money like crazy. But but that six hundred million that they threw, they don't have ten more six hundred million. No, to throw. but what they did, which was very tricky, they deferred the payments. He said, okay, defer my payment. He was supposed to get seventy million a year for ten years. He's getting paid two million for the next ten years, two million a year, and the rest is deferred. The reason he wanted to do that is so they could pay more players, better players, so they wouldn't have to go over the the budget, the cap. Oh, to hit the cap, right? So then he'll have a better team around them, right? But he'll still get his money at the end. That's right. And it's guaranteed money. Guaranteed. It's guaranteed. That's how I'd like it. Right. Seven hundred million. Tommy told me that too one day, but he never came through. It wasn't guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. When there's that G there, I'm gonna boy. make you rich. And I said, okay. Should have done money with a Saudi. Well, the, the Saudis had made a deal with me, and we needed one more signature, yeah. and it just didn't work out. I'm sorry, right. Scott. Thanks. I was afraid maybe they would blow up, you know, my house once they have me under control. Yeah, really. <laughs> and then go to uh, the second tab, because you know Sports Illustrated, they fired everybody. They 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 laid off their whole thing. Sports Illustrated chops entire staff. Future unclear, and it was reported on Newsmax. That's the first place I saw it. The entire staff of Sports Illustrated was laid off Friday, after Authentic, a licensed group that bought the magazine five years ago. Authentic, Authentic. They make clothes, right? Yeah. Wow. Terminated the agreement and published the terms. Yeah, they were li- yeah, they licensed, you know, hats and shirts. Now, why would they wipe the whole staff? So is this is this the the print magazine? Yeah, you know, Sports Illustrated. When no, but I, do they have like another uh, another medium that they're switching to, and they're just getting out of print or no? It just says and digital at the bottom, print yeah. and digital, print and digital. Oh forms. yeah, yeah, I didn't see that. So yeah. everyone okay. at Sports Illustrated has been there forever. Gone. So they're just killing Sports Illustrated. They were killing Sports Illustrated. Terminated and... the agreement to publish. Huh. Yeah, they're done. I mean, I have no idea what their what their money's like, but I would imagine, you know, Sports Center and all these other uh, real time I mean But to end it? I mean That's crazy. Well magazines you know are, are dead. dead. Yeah. You know, print but it's still online. But yeah, it's still but online. I... I guess they couldn't compete with all everything else <laughs> that's going on. I didn't think Sports Illustrated would be one of the, the first ones well, to go. But well, look what went. Look, the biggest companies are gone. Sears is gone. That's right. A lot of the biggest companies yeah. around they, they they don't last forever. They don't adapt correctly, and they're done. Yeah, Sears is in bankruptcy. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, when I had that, when I used to have an, you know, I had an engineering firm, and we were gonna. They wanted to put a Neiman Mar. There's a mall here, as you know, and it's like a higher end mall, but there's a Sears in there. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to put Neiman Marcus in. And when I had the engineering firm, we had gotten the job. So they offered Sears like tons of money to leave the Gardens Mall because they wanted to make it more like Boca Mall, which if you haven't been down to Florida, it's just like a mall with all expensive stores in it. Oh uh, yeah, you got Chanel, Sears won't take the money. Gucci, yeah. Louis. Yeah, Sears won't take the money. They're like still the there. End, it's like the high end meal business, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, like the high, all high end. Exactly. <laughs> so they went to Sears with I like tons of money, and they said, "No, nope, we're just going to ride the lease out for the four years we have left." And not a person walks through that fucking store. No. And it's huge. Through I, I work, but they're there. in bankruptcy. So if they gave them three hundred. Like, it's Simon's. Simon's owns all the big malls. Yeah. So Simon's, to me, they were, it was like a shot in the dark because what are you going to do? Give them $300 million? Well, they've already filed bankruptcy. Bankruptcy court's going to take it all. They're just going to milk it out until it's over. I can't, I, I would, I'd love to know the decision making behind that because like 20 years ago when I was like 18, 19, I used to work in the mall selling phones and we, the company I worked for had all their contracts and all the Simon locations, and I'd, I'd work at the uh, Palm Beach Mall location before they tore it down and made it open air and all that. Even back then, it was dead. 
there were just blank open suites here and there. Sears, did, I don't know how they could justify. And all, all the Sears I know have, have closed up. I'm surprised that one's even still open. See, I thought they made it as long as they did. Because when I was growing up, if you needed a tool, you didn't go to like Walmart or I don't even know if Lowe's was around. You went to Sears to get tools. Yeah, there was no. I mean, that's when I yeah. was growing up. There was no Home Depot no. Or when I was growing up. No Home no Depot. Lowe's. No Lowe's. You went you either to went Sears. to the corner hardware store yeah. or you went to Sears. Yeah, that was yeah. It. Sears, Sears is an interesting story because they were like they were like beyond Amazon of their time. You used to be able through the Sears Roebuck ca- catalog, you could buy like prefab houses right. like in the like forties and stuff like that. Like they were the first ones to do that, and I I uh, I read a bit about it years ago and it's crazy to see how far ahead like nowadays you're like oh of course but then to realize they were the first guys to do that and they exploded in the thought process that they had what was that other store like sears it started with a w uh god dang it it was like boscov's was one do you remember boscov down here up in pa they were all over it do you remember do you remember boscov's no boscov's was big well sears was the original catalog it was like looking through the internet. It yeah, just, yeah. Like, you know, you get a catalog and you order it from Sears, and then they became this huge and rifles and dresses. Yeah, and anything. I mean, they were like, they were like the they were like the Amazon of they were yeah. like the internet. They yeah, they right. were it. Yeah, it's like, yeah. So, yeah, and, and it was amazing to see they couldn't keep up with it. No, and times changed so fucking quick. Yeah, it, it just it, it went through the roof like it was nothing. Yeah, it's it's hard to fathom. Like when I when I started transitioning out of my last uh, business, I was trying to think of I have a bunch of different business ideas and things that I'm interested in and would love to pursue. But I, I, I always try to look at what's coming around the corner. It's hard to see around the corner, but you try to get some indicators. And there's one book that I read that was really influential on uh, a lot of the f- finalization of my thought process. Um, it's called The Future is Faster Than You Think. And they talk about all the converging technologies that we're going to be seeing that have not only happened, but these like independent revolutions where by themselves they're remarkable, but then you add them together and they're just going to disrupt so many industries. And it's hard for me to think now, what is a business that I could create and last 10 years, let alone pass on to my kids? Like back in the day, you'd start a plumbing service or you'd start a restaurant or something and you could potentially pass that down generational but that's those days are long gone because if you do have an idea that's scalable and it can compete with the big guys it's only a matter of time until they buy you out they undercut the prices or you know it's 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 hard to think of that so even these juggernauts of industry they're not adapting fast enough and changing their business model and they're just falling by the wayside and we're just seeing it you know the Kmart's the Sears Toys R Us Kmart. yeah Kmart they're they're gone too, Sears, Kmart, shit. They're just going. All, every all those stores I knew gr- growing up, man, they're just falling off. Left every right. once in a while, you'll see one like there. There's a Kmart. I don't even know if it's still around, but when I was living in Boca just a few years ago, there was a Kmart, and I remember like just walking into it out of curiosity. It's like, man, did this? Did did they get the the memo? Like I expected everybody to be dressed in like '90s clothes and stuff like that. And I was expecting everything to be cheap because like in my head, I'm just like if. This is like some kind of a time warp that I fell into. Like, how is this still in existence? But I, I, I think uh, I saw some. Uh, I believe Macy's maybe bought the rights to Toys R Us, but I don't imagine that they're going to be able to do their independent stores like they had back they in did. the day. <clears throat> they did when to- when I saw Toys R Us go out of business, I thought, oh shit, something is really bad, really bad now. Well, it's the internet. Yeah, the internet is. The yeah, internet. you see a toy. Let's. You're a parent. You got a little mm-hmm. kid. You you know the toy that you want. You know that she wants your to- that this toy. So you don't have to go to Toys R Us anymore. Yeah. yeah. Drag the just, kid there and right. then subject them to seeing everything. Oh, and that. Oh, <laughs> oh and that yeah. one. Oh, and that. Yeah. Oh, you just yeah. go just on Amazon now and you, yeah. you got your toy in yeah. ten minutes. Yep. And you don't have to go to ten different stores to get it. Yeah. That's yeah, what we used to have to do. It was it's, fucking nuts. Yeah. But you're right. It's the internet. But toy and it is in Macy's because I was just there and. My kid's into Paw Patrol right now. It's fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. Cop dog thing. Little dogs, all these yeah, guys. Yeah. And they have a whole section, and it says Toys R Us. And it's all... But it's not like... It's just like a clothing block. Yeah, it's a it's section. It's not big. Yeah, yeah, it's a section, and... The kids won't <laughs> have that experience. Maybe when we have VR, but that... I remember as a kid just walking through and just like, oh, 
Man. Like, yeah, Toys R Us, KB, KB store. KB, that KB, was, yeah, KB, KB, yeah, KB, KB Toys, mall, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, remember that? Man, see, they're all I, gone. I, they're all gone. But I, even though it was hell, I'm sure for my parents, it was so fun as a kid to go in there. But like you said, like, oh my gosh, it was and, heaven, man. And yeah, I, you know, I want this, I want that. But now it's like. Here, kid, here's an iPad, you know. <laughs> you know. Go buy your own shit. Yeah, go yeah. buy your own just shit and scrolling. get brainwashed in the way. Just remember you're a girl or a boy. <laughs> you know, you're not either or. Don't give a fuck. <laughs> you're a boy or a girl. I know it's tough to believe. You see that they charged Alec Baldwin again? No. You for, what? It? Uh, for the shooting? Yeah, go to the next one. Uh, be the third one right there. <clears throat> they hit him again. It's not that one. Next one. Next one, that one. X out of that. No, oh, thank you. Alec Baldwin indicted again. Actor Alec Baldwin had been indicted by Mexico grand jury on charges in 21 of the fatal shooting. And then they just hit him again because they went and they uh, watched the interview that he did. And he said he didn't pull the trigger. Yeah. And they had video footage that he did. Yeah. So now they're re-indicting him again. Because, look, involuntary manslaughter charges were dropped against Baldwin last year with prosecutors saying in a statement at the time that they could not proceed under the current time constraints and on the facts and evidence turned over by law enforcement in its existing form due to new facts of the case. Blah, blah. The initial decision to drop the involuntary manslaughter charge against Baldwin in April of last year came after authorities learned the gun used in the shooting may have been modified, a law enforcement source told CNN. Uh, go down where he's charged now. The film's assistant director, David Halls, was identified as the person who handed the firearm to Baldwin that fateful day in 23. He signed a plea agreement for the charge of negligent uh, use of a deadly weapon, prosecutors said, noting that the terms of the deal included six months of probation. Go down. I think that's it. That's it. So they're basically just saying right now that they're, they charged him again, and the reason why they're charging him is when he went on Fox, CNN, all of them, and he said that he never pulled the trigger, that they have proof that he did, so now he lied about it. So now it's involuntary, involuntary manslaughter. Yeah, and I think, I mean, a lot of people who aren't familiar with guns see them as these, I mean, they are dangerous, but they, they don't know the mechanics and how they work. And I believe if it's like a Western, it was probably like a double action gun, which requires some mechanic of cocking the hammer and then pulling the trigger. And even if it's a hair trigger, which is where you just redu reduce the, re uh, the weight resistance needed to pull the trigger, there's still going to be... There's hard metal in between that hammer coming down and you know striking the uh, the the firing uh, the firing me mechanism in in the the round. Something happens. Something has to happen in order to release that hammer. So right away, I was just like, okay, that's complete. It's it'd be one thing if it was like some BS old gun that you don't know what kind of work's been done to it, but it was made specifically for. You know the movies. It was. I know they go through some kind of an approval process, and you know, make sure that these guns are safe, especially after what happened to Bruce Lee's kid. They really got tight on that. And it's like, how did a real gun and real ammo make it onto a movie set? It's so. And then that gets into what kind of intent was there behind that? It's. I don't know. It's just. Well, I know that one's a, such I a know, weird, weird story. Well, I know it was a low budget film, which again, I mean, I know a low budget how, film with. Yeah, it was a low budget film. With but how could they afford well, him? You know, it's, it's his film. It's his film. Uh, it's his film. It's his film. Was it his gun? <laughs> uh, you know, it was a low budget film. His film. I think this was the first one he was doing. He's producing. Yeah. Yeah, he's producing. But still, like the insurance that they need for those things. Going back to insurance, yeah. they they got to check out on all those things and make sure, especially when there's stunts or anything like that. I don't know. That's just a weird one. I I, I forgot that that happened. Uh, I mean, I remember it happening, but that was kind of off my radar. But it's good right. to see that they're digging back into it, not just brushing it aside. Because it's sad that you know she lost her life, and it was just like, oh, my bad. I'm broken up about it. I'm but traumatized. But I'm because the victim. there's so much shit, you don't really know what, like, what really happened. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not like he pulled the. There's no way in my mind he was trying to kill somebody or shoot somebody. Yeah. So who handed him the gun? And 
he's an idiot. Okay, if the girl's standing there and the scene is, I shoot you, dude, you pulled the trigger. What do you think? The gun just, hello, sesame, shoot? Yeah. I, I mean, why would you even lie about that? Unless you didn't pull the trigger and they're setting you up, but then how'd she get fucking hit? And then, it, I mean, if he didn't lie, then it could at least, you know, take whatever repercussions come with that and not lying because that's going to just exacerbate things. But then that would allow it to go to, okay, well, who is the prop guy? Who was the one who put that round in there? Because the actors, I would assume, again, if it's low budget, I don't know who's who's setting those things up. But I don't know. That's a, that's another... See, I think if he would have just been 100% honest, just like the other guy got negligence and probation, maybe he would have got negligence in six months or, mm -hmm. or something. But now he's looking at a whole thing. And tons of lawyers, and you got somebody who died, and that family's not very happy. And if you did catch him in a lie, because they said they held a lot of evidence, so if they have him pulling that trigger, he's fucked. So they were, they were rolling film at the time that it happened, so they've got it? Well, it, in the article, they... Initially, they couldn't charge him because law enforcement won't handle, like, whoever was in the head of the investigation, the head of the head, wouldn't hand over all the evidence. So maybe the camera crew didn't give everything that they actually had or they didn't think that they had. So they couldn't hit him the first time because they didn't have everything that all of law enforcement had. Mm -hmm. Now they have everything. So now they're hitting him. And when that discovery comes out, which is what happened from A to Z... If in that discovery they have him filmed pulling that trigger, he's fucked. Yeah. There's no way out of that one. Because now you lied about it, and they have that on camera, on TV, on national TV. So if you're him, unless you have some way to break every camera and pay off every camera guy, there might be that one camera guy you can't. To say you didn't pull it's fucking nuts, being that she died, unfortunately. You know what I mean? And he goes into court with a lie, with a crying family, and he seems to have a temper. You know, I was he ever on the on the show? Million, millions of times. Yeah, N nice guy. Uh, Yo, yeah, I mean, uh, my interaction with him was very nice. He was very pleasant to be with, and you know, nice conversation. Never any. Ask you know, he's it. not going to be like that in that right. situation. I mean, yeah. there there are situations in New York where they've got him. Getting in fights with people parking you know, cars and stuff like that. And that's what showed the temper. And you know what I always say? I say he's a fucking human being. Yeah. Uh, because he's a celeb. If somebody pulled out in front of, you know, I might yell at somebody or scream at somebody too. <laughs> I know like, I would. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you're this crazy violent person. But because he's an actor, right. at, they just catch him on the temper and he probably does something they don't agree with. And then. And that's what gets the clicks and the eyeballs, yeah, the sensationalized another, yeah. negativity. Yeah, and I, I'm sure the family wants to go through all this again, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's probably a miserable thing to endure. No, it's, and then, <clears throat> I remember you always talking about the NFTs, and you brought up, are, are you done with the NFTs, or are you still on that? Uh, I'm not, not hot on them. I was very curious about them. I think that there's amazing potential. I think it's going to be revolutionary. Um, but I think that with a lot of things, especially in the crypto related atmosphere, things get overhyped. Um, the hype goes beyond the actual value and what the real world utilities are at that time. And then it'll cast a negative light on it and you'll see it die back down. But I think they're going to pop back up. But a lot of times it's, it's going to be correlative to what's going on with the crypto market. So when we see another bull run, there'll be another mad dash for NFTs. Um, but I think what will really solidify them is the average person seeing the real world uses. Because a lot of times you mention NFTs to people and they're just going to be like, oh, yeah, that stupid thing where you're paying millions of dollars for a cartoon i'll just take a screen like joe rogan he's like well i got a screenshot of it it's on my phone how do i not own it but there's so much more behind that that if explained to people like I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who are like nft doubters and i explain aside from your impression here's some real world uses and it's like okay actually yeah that does make sense like, like pull up six the the thing with that with the nft the reason why i think now it's fucked is because other than uh, Beeple's, like with him, you get something physical that's numbered. Okay, not not all of them, but some of them. Yeah, some of do them come you with that. Yeah, right, that do that. These ones, like like the the this shit. Yeah, the board I'll apes. You got to explain these this shit to me. But we went on. A, remember, we talked about this before one of the earlier times, and yeah. they were like, 
at, in the twos, like two something. Now they're just through the roof. But now it's like a fucking picture that somebody came up with. I don't know how there's not copyright issues other than the blockchain. When I think the NFT thing will have value because I see celebrities like, okay, buy the NFT and you get a ticket and blah, blah. That, that's not going to work. I think when this is worth anything in reality is when AI and everything else evolves so much that you don't know what. Like you have no way of telling what's a copy, what's real, who's who. Then with the blockchain, then I can see how an NFT, like a painting, Right. Because soon you won't know who painted it. Yeah. You could say it was this famous guy and there's absolutely no way to tell because these printers are so good. Blah, blah, blah. But with an NFT that goes on the blockchain. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where nobody can copy it. There's so many made and that's it. And you can't fugazi it. Right. Yeah. So that's when I think the art of life, you know, everybody buys, you know, crazy paintings. I think when AI gets so good and all this other shit, that's when the NFT thing, that's when it becomes massive. Mm -hmm. Because art, you won't be able to tell what's real and what's fake with the art. You can't now. They're already fighting about a Mona Lisa right now. Well, there, there's a lot of, and and that's the thing that a lot of people, there the most people know about NFTs, and like I said, they associate it with, oh, it's just a picture of a JPEG. What's the difference between me having a screenshot of that on my phone? NFTs, you know, means non-fungible token. So the token is part of a collection of things. Getting away from art, here's a, a real-world example that I, I used um, to convince some of my friends of the utility, be, the potential utility of NFTs. I bought some tickets to, uh, was it? I bought tickets to Shane Gillis. Um, I ended up having to fly out of town for a bachelor party. So then I sold them, bought them from Ticketmaster and sold them on Ticketmaster, or Subhub or whatever else. And I don't know, actually, this is a better example. I bought some tickets from somebody secondary who bought them from Ticketmaster. I bought them from that person and that person, I had to wait until the day of the concert for that person to send it to me. And I'm waiting and waiting, waiting and freaking out. And it was all because of Ticketmaster. And then I got to worry that that guy might have printed those tickets out. And he shows up with a paper, gets his barcode scanned. And then when I show up, that always worries me. But where it's an NFT, it'd be an instant transfer. No, you don't get to print out the ticket. Pull up your phone, pull up your encrypted wallet, and I'll scan the barcode off of that. And then let's say I'm a ban who now we've made it so that the tickets can be transferred peer-to-peer -peer instantaneously without Ticketmaster or anybody else getting their hands on it. Immediate, as soon as I pay for it, it's in my wallet. You don't have it anymore. Only I have access to it. But now, let's say as a band, I want we're going to put on a, a concert and we want, or we're releasing a new album or a song off our new album, and we want to make that accessible with a priority to people who have supported us in the past. So if you've gone to a concert in the past or if you bought our album before or if you bought you've gone to three concerts or went to a comedy show you get access yeah. to buy before people or these vip tickets are only available to people who have you know history on the blockchain verify that they've you know been a supporter now you can access it and you can access this this opportunity to buy these uh, uh these you know new tickets the new album have the new sound drop you know i can i can drop load sound files of you know the new song off the new album that's coming out in a few months i could put that right in your wallet right now so only those people so it builds that exclusivity so then there's going to be that value of having that that access and like you said the automatic authenticity whereas if i have it i know it's legit it's on the blockchain i can't i can't fake that see i didn't know you could do that see if i would have known that and why they don't push that more i don't know because i always worry i'm gonna lose the fucking ticket i gotta dig for the email i lost the email and then if I do use StubHub, which is owned by Ticketmaster, they're all owned by Ticketmaster. The guy got, I had a guy in who got indicted. That's a whole fucking, that, you want to talk about a racket. Ticketmaster owns them all. Really? Ticketmaster owns StubHub. Live Nation. Live Nation and Evenbrite. They own, they're all subsidiaries. So Ticketmaster goes and they have a guy and they, and they give this guy, say, $3 million, And he buys every ticket but, say, 1,000 of Taylor Swift concert. Because Taylor Swift in her deal, every concert sold out. Now, the guy who got in trouble for this 
funny. Only one guy, and he's African American. Isn't that odd? Everybody else got fines. Chad Focus was the guy who did it, and he had massive computers and software. And the way he did it was slick. This is fucking slick. And th- I mean, this is one smart dude. So he grew up in the projects of Baltimore, but he didn't want to go the drug route. He had brains. So he would go to all these engineer uh, events, but he was the only black guy there. So we'd walk in, he'd have a nice wash, the Jordan's on. So a lot of times, uh, like a diehard engineer, they're kind of, you know, maybe a little geeky, nerdy. And now this cool guy from the hood, he's coming in and he wants to hang out with one of those engineers that that engineer never got to hang out with the cool guy with Jordans. So Chad would get good with the engineers. They'd be like, okay, well, how does this work? How does that work? And he built up how the system works. So over time, long story short, he figured it all out. So then Ticketmaster would send him, and I, I saw it. He was indicted for it. They put 900 grand on a Walmart card. He would take it. And then he would talk to his wife. Hey, uh, so-and-so, you want to go to the concert tonight? Ah, uh, let me think about it. Now, he's timing this, right? Okay. It takes two minutes and 16 seconds to make a decision. So now he's got 20,000 computers, okay? Let's just say. Maybe it's 5,000, all right? And he times every one of those computers to buy a ticket every two minutes and 11 seconds. Because by law, Ticketmaster, StubHub, they all have to have a timer thing on it, mm-hmm. right? They just have to. It's yeah. something with the sale. So every two minutes, and or otherwise the fraud detector goes off and it looks like it's him doing it illegally, right? Yeah. So now every two minutes and 36 seconds, boom, tickets bought. Now there's 1,000 tickets left, okay? 500 goes to the radio station, blah, 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 blah. 500 left to make it look good. The rest go to StubHub for triple the price, quadruple the price, even bright. Now, Ticketmaster writes off that 900000 that they paid Chad to market it. So that 900000 is a write-off for marketing. Then those tickets are given to StubHub, even bright Live Nation, which is a subsidiary, right? Another LLC to write off. And now you have it. Now the person pays 1600 but Ticketmaster paid dog shit. Right, they made all their money on their own shit, then resold it for three times the amount. And they don't have to cut in Taylor and Swift. And they don't have to cut. Yep. And now Taylor Swift sold out. She's all good. She's happy. Contract signed. Boom. Done. And they make hand over fist. Fucking wild. Smart dude. Smart dude. Then it all crashes down because he got. He was so good. This guy can't sing or rap to save his life. He was number one on Billboard for three months. <laughs> Went on tour with fucking little baby, mm-hmm. Khaled, the whole nine. Then the indictment comes down. Everybody gets wazillion dollar fines. He gets three or four years in prison plus probation. Only person. <laughs> 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 fucking unreal, right? And Subhub, they're all still running. They just switched the LLC, you know. Yeah. Instead of LLC, it's probably Inc. Yeah, the <laughs> corporate shell game. Corporate shell game. But these board apes, scroll down. I mean, 61,000. Huh? Look, 20.9 20. million. Like, explain the how. So a lot of the value with... 120. So just let me get this straight. I buy that guy with the eye shit coming out of it, <laughs> and it's $127,000, okay? And I just get that picture on my in my email, and I just save you, it. Well, you have a, an encrypted crypto wallet. That would be the the holder for this. So that's where you'd store it. You can share it on any social media to show that you're the owner. And like Twitter has a, a built-in authenticator where if you were to put it like as your your Twitter uh, profile picture, there's a special um, like little hexagon box that goes around to show that it's an authentic, verified NFT, not just a picture of that you know screenshot that you uploaded and, and claim that you're the owner of. But with Board Ape in particular, their utility, uh, quote unquote, uh, the value that they have is not only being one of the, f- the the first that blew up. It was like Board Apes and CryptoPunks, and they're the ones that have the astronomical value. And everybody wants any every NFT uh, project wants to be one of them. 
But these guys were like one of the first. So it's like Coke and Pepsi. They're at the top. They've got the name recognition. But then it becomes this exclusive club where they will literally have, you know, yacht parties and rent out, you know, the the hottest nightclub in Miami or uh, an entire hotel for a seminar. And it's exclusively available to the NFT holders. So now imagine just getting in the room with other guys who have the ability to drop millions of dollars on an nft like eminem owns one of these so there's that clout factor where okay there's only ten thousand of these in the world and and it was one of the first ones and it was one of the first ones and and they're funny yeah they're kind of funny and cool I guess. and then the little attributes they'll each be assigned a rarity like there's only so many of these you know black uh bowler hats there's only so many with the laser eyes so the characteristics are kind of randomly generated uh where like when I built the NFT, I was able to do that where I made these different image files um, and there'd be a certain amount with the open mouth and a smile, an open mouth with the tongue hanging out or whatever else. And then they would, the computer would randomly say, okay, Casey wants to, out of 10,000 possible, you know, permutations that we're going to make, Casey wants 5% of them to have the laser eyes and 1% of them to have the gold sailor hat and, you know, 0.001% of them to have the baby bonnet. So then when you have these rare attributes, that increases the value because there's only so many of them. And then when you have overlapping rare attributes, like the rare hat with the rare eyes and the rare t-shirt, it makes even more scarce. So that's why, like, you'll see the, the price variances within the actual collection because of the attributes that they have. But the overall... Uh, Access is going to be the same whether you bought the one for sixty five thousand or the one for twenty two million. You'll still be able to access the same club event or whatever board ape event that they're having. But the um, the the whole kind of claim to fame is them being first, first, them being so expensive, and now you know that you know you're rubbing elbows with somebody else who dropped. So for business networking purposes and things like that, that right? you know, it could be invaluable. If I'm selling you know jets or you know, if I'm a, a, a guy who's, you know, signing sports athletes or something like that, that's the group I want to be in. And they have their own private, like, uh, chat communities yeah, and stuff. All kinds of shit. Yeah. On. You got to piss? I got to pee. Yeah. So now, with these, do they keep their value? Uh, to an extent, the the craze phase is definitely tapered down. Like I said, it's correlative to, like, the crypto market. And what you'll see a lot of times is with crypto, you'll have these... Uh, ancillary markets that will take turns kind of having the these different um you know like bull runs of themselves where they'll they're, they'll be popular and that's where everybody you know sees gold in the west and starts going towards that and then in the next cycle it'll rotate the interest rotates somewhere else so the nfts were really big in a previous bull run they've you know then the bear bear market comes the entire interest in the crypto market dies down. Um, A lot of it is based on Bitcoin. If Bitcoin's pumping, Mm -hmm. then that kind of brings interest to crypto in general. And then the mindset is kind of either I made profit on Bitcoin or I'm late to enter and look, Bitcoin's going. What else can I buy into that's cheaper? What else is hot right now? And that's where the interest and the money will flow into something else. So they had NFTs had their run. uh, And these are primarily Ethereum based NFTs. Um, altcoins, which Ethereum is one, Ethereum is one of the altcoins. Those had a previous run in a previous bear market, and then it'll shift to something else. I think with this next up, upcoming run, will be a lot of interest in uh, what are called ordinals, which are NFTs, but on Bitcoin's blockchain. And Bitcoin never really had any NFTs that took off. Um, a lot of it comes down to like the storage capacity and the cost and everything and it's it's kind of cost prohibitive um to have you know nfts on the bitcoin chain but some people have done some um, innovations that have made it easier to inscribe uh nfts on the the bitcoin blockchain so i think this next bull run it'll be ordinals which they will have these you know graphic nfts as well because that's what people love it's it's almost like a tangible thing but then there's also going to be some that like i said before they've got utilitarian purposes and there's other projects out there that 
are NFTs and they have legitimate utilitarian purposes, but they haven't exploded with as much notoriety as these visual based ones. So like I said, a lot of times people think NFT, they'll think of a picture of a JPEG doesn't make any sense. But like I said, they got a bad rap right now. Yeah. <clears throat> like overall, they got a horrible but, rap. But they'll come back. I think they will. I, I think they will with the art. And like like the... But the simpler thing, it's hard to cut you off. Simpler question, like when when Bitcoin takes a dump, right? And everybody's like, oh my, you know, I lost a ton. Do these take a dump? Yeah, because they, okay. they're, so, uh, they're that's correlative. Where the but it never thing. goes low like it was before they never like bitcoin bitcoin's never gone back to 300 bucks i remember the first time i heard about it i was like oh it's too late it's worth like three or four hundred bucks and i'm shooting myself in the foot i wish i you know threw some money at that what's it worth right now uh right now it's in the low 40s it went from 300 to 40 yeah oh it's been the highest was uh 69 thousand wait what yeah Bi per, per bitcoin yeah it went from 69 thousand and what's a coin worth now? Six to nine thousand. And then I think we got down into like the mid teens at the bottom of the last uh, run, a uh, uh, bull market or bear market, I should say. Now it's gone back up into the 40s. I think it was just at like 48 a little while ago uh, with, you know, the announcement of the ETFs, BlackRock and all those guys. And now the ETFs well, came to fruition. What did BlackRock do? Uh, BlackRock. Um, basically filed BlackRock and a bunch of other companies, but uh, BlackRock got a lot of the press for filing uh, applications for ETFs, um, uh, Bitcoin-based ETFs to be traded on the you know stock exchange. And that brings a lot of legitimacy to it. So BlackRock is involved in this? Oh, I'm done. BlackRock. I'm out. Your legitimacy. Well, hey, for legitimacy, you to say that is out of... Legitimacy, you're fucking me up here, man. Legitimacy from the perspective of where am I going to invest my retirement funds? Not anything with BlackRock. And that, Well, that's the thing is they never <laughs> lose. So if you're investing, I think they're super corrupt. I don't like the, the, the result of a lot of their actions and what's going on. But, you know, if you're going to bet with them or against them, you're going to make more money betting with them. Uh, I get uh, you're right because you're you know, not going to lose. I, there's going to be pension I would funds be worried and all sorts of what, stuff. I would be concerned with them because whatever they spend on this shit is a drop in the bucket to them. Yeah. So are they getting into it to fuck everybody, or are they getting into it because they want to run it? I, I think they just want control over every possible thing that could make money. So buying up residential houses, buying up farmland in Ukraine, whatever it is. And they've got more and more money coming in every day, and they're just buying more and more stuff. And if you you know, you know bet on all the horses, then you're bound to win. And if I'm using my own money, I'm going to take some losses too, but they're leveraging other people's money, so it affords them the ability to not only make all the bets that they want to make by getting a little piece of everything, but then also when they control so many different resources, and now they can leverage that to ensure their bets, like... If they wanted to pump Bitcoin, they also invest in a lot of media companies, huh? So when they want to put pressure on those media companies to write good stories about Bitcoin, Yo. Bitcoin price goes up. <laughs> I'm sticking to I'm going back to my original. If they're involved, fuck no. Hell no. Because there's a reason why, and it's not good, and somehow it's going to crash and burn, and the, the people, not them, the people that have it are going to get fucked. They're not going to get fucked. But the people that have are going to get fucked because they hate America. BlackRock is worldwide, right? Yeah, but Bitcoin is worldwide. Okay. And Bitcoin fucks everybody worldwide. But BlackRock isn't fucking other countries with everything else they're doing. They're just targeting here along with Bank of America, who's running through your bank to see if you said. Tr you, you know why my Zell got canned, I think? I'm pretty sure. Out of nowhere. You know, they just came out with how Bank of America scraped everybody's Zelle to see if it said Trump or MAGA or in the thing. From, yeah. Okay. Well, I had Colby Covington in, the UFC guy. Yeah. And <clears throat> when I sent him uh, a Zelle, like, to go back and forth. Oh, he's blackballed, man. He's on the wrong list. Right. Well, when they went through and scraped data, I bet you that's why this morning I no longer had a fucking Zelle. I, I wouldn't put it past them, man. I heard that <laughs> even if you shopped at, you know, uh, Outdoor World or And Cabela's, who runs Bank of America? 
BlackRock. Yeah. They run everything. I've seen these guys do analytics or uh, do a, a analysis of, you know, who owns this company? Well, it's this company. And then who owns them? Well, they're major shareholders them. And then who owns them? Well, they're a subsidiary of here. They're under the umbrella of here. And it all leads back to BlackRock, I should have State known. Street, yep. and Vanguard. And then and Vanguard, I forgot. About and those guys, the verticals. And those guys own pieces of each other. Yeah. So they're not monopolies. That's sick. <laughs> They're not monopolies, but no. they all have vested interests. Well, yeah. There's another issue that we're running into in the co-op industry, which is LLCs buying apartments and co-ops Yep, and renting them, and they own them, the LLCs, which you're not allowed to do according to the bylaws of most co condos and co-ops. It's a limited liability company. How the hell can you buy that? They've been buying, they've been buying places, renovating them, and then renting them, which you're not supposed to do either. Whoa. So we they they're now starting like to to have bylaws that say you cannot we cannot sell to LLCs. And now they are only yeah only individual people you could sell to you can't sell to an LLC. And there's also um, I guess it'd be a bill that's being proposed or I don't know what's what what the status is of it now but it's basically going to be banning the publicly traded companies from buying up these residential homes that they've been doing and they buy them just to rent them out. And supposedly it's going to force them to liquidate their holdings 10% hmm. uh, a year over the next 10 years. And they've got a total of like 75 million uh, residential houses or something like that. So 10% a year, that's 750,000 residential houses a year that they're going to have to be dumping on the market to liquidate. Um, if let me guess through. who can buy them up. Vanguard. Well, no, Blackguard. they won't be allowed to. Vanguard won't be able to. No, because that, that's the whole thing is like the the oh, big guys won't be traded. able to. Well, they'll just do it. No, but here's the what they're going to do. The, they won't be you, buying up your house when you sell it. But what they're going to do is they're going to build communities of houses that are going to be built to rent. So that's the new thing is like, well, these we're not buying and competing with the you know average Joe, that's we're lucrative. building our own. And if they choose to rent from us, you know, there's no law against that. <laughs> this is just us condi conducting business. So it's scary, that, man. That's just another way of them taking over. Yeah. And if, Holy you, fuck. If, and if you can afford your mortgage and the crazy interest rate, congratulations. We just doubled your rent insurance or your uh, homeowner's insurance. Wow. They are running. And now when you go to sell your house along with everybody else in your neighborhood and your comps have dropped because everybody's trying to liquidate, we'll buy it up. You know, that's what was going on. If this if this blocks it, they're still going to find another way. And you know what's funny is not one thing we've talked about tonight is a conspiracy. This is all like factual. Depends shit. Depends on who you ask. Uh, well, it's yeah. not. Yeah. I mean, this is all like this is all stuff you can verify it, and yeah. see. But, but it's like. It, but you try telling that to somebody. You see, not, yeah. I've got some friends, and they just oh, yeah. they're they're very intelligent guys, and they just can't connect dots. They refuse to connect dots. There's just coincidences and. It, it's but just, do you see the writing on the wall? You have they're they're throwing this shit with the apartment. They're, they're going to own everything. Mm -hmm. So there's no middle class. There's no lower class, and all there is is the elite, rich, and robots. Yeah, it'll, is that not what you're seeing happening? I mean, tell me if that. Tell me what you think. It's a crazy world, and I'm lucky I only have 20 years left. <laughs> in it or something like that. It's, I mean, it's, it's changing scary. so fast. Yeah. Fucking nuts. And I look at I look at like communism and I've I've read like like we were saying earlier, I try to educate myself on you know everyone's perspectives. So I've read, you know, communist manif manifestos and Marx's writings, just to understand the mentality. It's a great sales pitch, but I've come to appreciate the fact that they've got a long, patient plan. Just like China. They think in generational terms, we think in four year terms. You know, so we're just thinking about the next election and they're thinking, how am I going to set my grandchildren up, my great grandchildren to, to eventually. And they're like, I'll take a loss here. I'll take a hit on the chin. You know, they talk, everybody talks China, China, China. They do a lot of bad shit, but they cut that internet off at 6 p.m. The kids can't be on the Internet past six. Yeah. You got to study. You got to learn. Men have to go to the military for one year. Mandatory. You have to go to the military. So I think, I mean. Like you said, they got 100-year plans, mm -hmm. and right now they're going like this. Right now they're going, ah, everything is absolutely perfect. This is awesome. We're making headway. Okay, we might have to stop for four years, but they don't care. Because say somebody gets in there that, you know, they're not really 
they can't walk over and do whatever they want, right? Now they might have to tighten up and do things kind of right, but think in this last four years what they got away with and how much progress they made. While they keep getting, and they're looking over at America and they're going, you fools are worried about what bathroom to go into, what you're going to do with who, you know what I mean? They have this, uh, there's, there's a term in Chinese that um, basically means, it's like a, a strategy that means to use your enemy's strengths against them. So our strengths as a free society is everyone's got an opinion, everybody can say stuff, you know, they don't have this conformist kind of structure like they do in China where you can't, you know, can't stick out, otherwise you're going to get hammered. Over here, it's Hong. all about that. So now they're using the free speech and the open markets and capitalism and everything else to destroy letting us. us eat ourselves from the inside. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. every move is like, I like I said before, I just see... A, a closer and closer move towards socialism. And Marx even said socialism is a necessary step towards communism. Communist countries can't have a competitor out there who's succeeding because then their people, if they get wind of it, they'll be like, well, look in the U S they look a lot more healthy and they can do all this stuff and they're happy and everything else. So they can't have that example of an ulterior way to rule. Mm -hmm. They have to take over everybody. And, like the housing and everything else. Oh, you can't afford your house? No problem. We've created government housing. And now I don't like what you said, so you just get downgraded. You can't afford the 3-3. Three, three. We're going to move you into the 2-2. Two, two. But I got five kids. doesn't matter. We don't like your opinions. We don't like who you liked on Facebook 10 years ago. We don't like this opinion you had. We don't you know, like all these little data points that they're just collecting, and, and it's out there, and we can't get it back. And eventually, if it keeps going that the, you know that route i could see communism almost being an inevitability unless there's some rapid and like you said it's going to go back to the agrarian age where it's the nobility and the servants and when they no longer need the servants to till the fields and drive the buses because we got ai and automation now we're just a burden yeah it's just like who are these idiots just fucking up the planet you know, shitting in the street, pissing in the street. You know, it's just, that's what it's going to be like. Like, And we're just opinion, eyesores. Oh, I like going to the beach and having nobody else there, but other yeah. billionaires and trillionaires yeah. and nobility. Yeah, nobody's screaming and yelling and I don't know, you know, that that's what I see it coming to. Yeah, it's scary. And then the higher you get up in power, I mean, I think it just becomes more of a, I know you, you've got uh, your, your beliefs on Elon like I said, I I don't know. I, 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 I hold keep going back sides. and forth with him. I do too. I've I've got I don't I've got know. the the two different voices in my head, and more than that probably, and I can hold those different opinions. But the way I look at it is, he's the only hope that we have who's got the position to prevent and maybe cure or at least push this off for somebody else to kind of pick up the flag, picking up Twitter. I think that saved free speech um, or destroy. Yeah, and that's the other thing that's scary is if he's actually a bad guy and he's just playing the good guy, so we're all like, yeah, Elon, yeah, you show him. And then one day he's like, okay, now I've got everything I need. Now he could own the world because he's got the satellites, he's got the rocket ships, he's got the cars that are automated. Tunnels. The tunnels. He's got Twitter, crazy amounts of data there. He's got AI. He's A lot of people forget he's been they've been building those, like, Tesla isn't a car company. He's always said it's a technology company. Tesla is also making those animatronics, those robotic dudes. So he's building his own army. So it's like iRobot and Terminator and all that stuff to the nth degree because he's got everything. He's going to have his own internet. Did you see last week one of it, the robots at Tesla went nuts? No. No. I, it, was that real? No. I've, real. I've seen a bunch of fake ones. There was only, there. No, it was one. It was only one. But it, it realized like. Something computed up there that it was a robot, and it started attacking employees. It was only one. It wasn't like 10. It was one that, I don't know if you want to call it a glitch or what, but, I mean, it, it's glitch common. Glitch or an inevitability. Or inevitability that maybe went a little bit too fast. I, I go back and forth with him, but where I can't get my head off of is he buys Twitter for double the amount, more than double the amount releases those Twitter files, knowing nothing's going to happen. Everybody knows nothing's going to happen, but it looks good. looks like free speech guy. Mm -hmm. But then when he put in that Linda, like I told you last time, Linda, whatever her name is, as fucking CEO, who is the most, the most non-free speech, she is all the way to, if you want to call it the left, if you want to call it, 
against humans. She is as far as that as it goes. And that's who he appoints. And then four days later, Neuralink, you know, like the chip that goes in your head. That's the other thing. Yeah. Gets approved four days later after he appoints her by the FDA for final testing for Alzheimer's and quadriplegics and quadriplegics, a couple of them. So, and he knows once that goes through and that's approved and it works, now he can submit the chip chip. So now if you have the chip chip and you got the fucking social media and you got the car and you got the tunnel and you got the satellite up there and you got the spaceship and maybe a phone. Now one guy has controlled everything. Yeah. So even if he's not bad right now, which I don't know, nobody can handle that kind of that amount of power because if you have that chip and people are going to run for that chip immediately, mm -hmm. then you have AI coming and you can control that chip. With the social media and the other thousand things this guy's got going on, you turn evil because you rule the fucking world is what you do. Yeah. And that that's why, like, I I really hope. I, I, I hope. Because if, if he were to flip over to the wrong side or if he's working for him and just playing a really game, a really good game, then. Uh... So let's say he's not, right? But there's no human being. Human beings aren't meant to have that much power. That's world power, human domination. Like, we're just not meant to have that. And as smart as he is and as relaxed as he is, when he has all that power to control everything, it's a dangerous situation, and there's no human being, in my opinion, that can handle it. Yeah. Look at all the powerhouses. They're all fucking goofballs. Yep. Just tons of money, tons of power. You got yes people everywhere. What do you do? Yeah, it's... it's uh. It's it's a crazy and very alarming and scary thought experiment to go down that route. But the way I look at it is uh, it's kind of like, you know, Trump and, and Kennedy, you see them as, you know, the only hopes of really draining the swamp and gutting this corrupt system. Elon's right up there where it's like, man, I see a lot of reasons why they could just be telling us a really good story, painting a good image. And they could, once they get in control, they could flip the script. Um, and when you have unlimited money from these other countries that things are going just like they want them to, you have unlimited money, unlimited money, man, you can make a lot of things happen. Oh, so yeah. Twitter looks like it's all clean and this and that. You don't fucking know. Yeah. You don't know. And I think they all work together. But you know what? You know what Pegasus is? Yeah. Yeah, the hacking uh, software. Yeah, go to the next tab, right? The very next one. So, do you know that now it just before they had to, you had to click on something. Yeah. Now it's just your phone number. Yeah. You knew that. Oh yeah. Of course you knew that. But if people don't know what Pegasus is, it's a spyware. I I didn't know that it was developed by Israeli cyber arms company. I I didn't know that. I thought we actually came with it. I thought we did. No, I yeah I, I remember hearing it was uh originally Israeli developed and like you said before there were there'd be something where you're not necessarily opting in but you had to do some kind of action you had to get the click text link open click on it right. and now you're screwed but now it's just well it says as of March 2023 Pegasus operators were able to remotely install spyware on iOS versions through 16.3 using a zero click exploit while the capabilities of Pegasus may vary over time due to software updates, Pegasus is generally capable of reading text messages, call snooping, passwords, locations, tracking, the whole nine. Now go to the next tab. The very next tab over is how they're, they're doing it just with the phone number. And scroll down. Your phone number is all a hacker needs, how spyware puts you at risk. How spyware works by exploiting your phone number. Your phone number is the key that unlocks access to your digital life. Unfortunately, it's also the, the key that spyware developers are eager, eager to exploit. Pegasus is designed to hack into phones using just a phone number. Once Pegasus is installed, it has everything. And that happened to Bezos. Yeah, That's how they I got heard Bezos. about that. Yeah. Out of all people. The Israeli prince, this fucking guy. The Israeli prince gets Jeff Bezos. <laughs> now... How dangerous is that? So they just need to, am I understanding this right? If they know my number, 
That's it. That's all I need. Yeah, and the way I've been thinking once I once I heard about that development is just I already assume that there's hacks and breaches and all sorts of stuff that's inevitably going to come out. And I think a lot of any companies that have uh, an, an aggregate of sensitive data like that, they've probably already been compromised. And what keeps them from just randomly, you know what, let's just install it on every single permutation of every single cell phone number that's out there. I might not know Tommy's cell phone number, but if I just install this on everybody, almost as effective as a zero day exploit, it's already out there. Now I can figure out, well, I know Tommy's always going this area and he talks to these people. So now that I'm watching all of them, show me the phones that have that connection. Okay, now it's a list of this many. Okay, now based on the time and the travel, okay, this one's Tommy. So now let's look at Tommy's messages. And now let's go back through his entire history because even though we can't scroll back and see our text from 10 years ago, there's somewhere, you know, they're, they're, they're out there. Data gets cheaper and cheaper to store. So these companies, you know, we think that they delete stuff. I, I always laugh when I see these uh, companies, these third party companies that offer services where <laughs> they supposedly force Google to delete your data and they force Facebook yeah, right. to delete your data. Okay. Give me a break. Yeah. They just have it somewhere else that you can't see it. But, and what I think is funny is why they're exploiting the iPhone. You know why? Why they're saying sixteen point oh blah blah blah? Because but Android's uh, easiest. It's it's a I mean. single software that is the most common. Even though there's technically more Android phones out there, they're the most popular is going to be the iPhone and the iPhone iOS. So it used to be so hard to hack compared to Windows, but the payoff is so much better because you have so many more targets that you're able to instantly. See, I wonder if they can get into. Because they they won't tell you. I looked and looked. If you if you're on a beta program or a developer program and you're on like seventeen point five, I wonder if they can do it then. I would assume, yeah. As long as they have the phone number, it's just a couple. Okay, what did this little tiny you know two megabyte update do? Oh, we tweaked it. Blah 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 blah. blah. And it's, nobody knows. Dangerous, 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 dangerous. Yeah, I just assume everything is being recorded and. It, it could come back to bite you, At and it doesn't have to point. be public like a controversial Twitter yeah. post. You know, it's a private conversation that, depending upon your value to them, like the average Joe, they don't care about what you're talking about. But if you become somebody else, you're connected to somebody who does become, you know, somebody they want to exploit or throw dirt on or whatever else. And I think in the future with, you know, uh, the, uh, what's the face thing that they... Deep fake. Between as soon as I saw a deep fake, I was like, it's just a matter of time before What's a deep fake. What's that? A deep fake is where they could put Kevin Spacey's face on your face and oh. change your voice so that whatever yeah, you, you no say, idea, right? Yeah. And it's only a matter of time until they fake. They can't find anything juicy on you, and they just fake it. And here's a video, and you pump that out. By the time it's debunked, ten percent of people who saw it saw the debunked retraction if it even gets out and the public opinions already changed on you anyways, you know, so Same it's, with the podcast, it's not going to be, you know, finding Hunter Biden's laptop at a repair place anymore. They'll yeah. just, it's too much work. He looks clean. Let's just make some dirt and just ruin it enough, cycle it enough. And by the time he's done with the election, we can let the truth come out. But until then debunk all the people right. who are trying to expose this being fraudulent and just pump this as the headlines and the clickbait. You control everything. <clears throat> Last thing I wanted to run by you. Um, do you think we went to the moon? I was literally having a text conversation with my, I've got a group, uh, a chat group of friends, and I'm like the resident, and I, I know the hell out of uh, some of them in there with my always putting in conspiracy theories and stuff like that. But a good amount of them now have today were like, yeah, I don't think we landed on the moon. Yeah, I don't think this. Why doesn't this? And I'm like, Okay, I'm finally starting to get some of them to open up because I look at it as it's like pulling a thread. What else does that lead to? Because then it's like, okay, that's nice. Welcome to the club. You don't believe that that happened. And like I said, I, I can hold both ideas. Yes, we did. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. And we lied just to take some of the steam out of the, uh, you know, take uh, some wind out of the Soviets' sails. Okay. But then it comes down to, okay, now if you believe it was a lie, Why? And what else did they lie about? Because a lot of effort went into that lie for decades, for an entire you know lifetime. A lot of stuff went into that. A lot of resources Rocks, went into that. Everything. Yeah. Do you think we went? You do? 
Yeah. Okay. I don't think we went. And I was upset that we did. Well, you guys weren't alive. Well, let me let me tell I, you why. I let, was alive that day. Well, let me tell you why. Let yeah. me tell you why. Go let ahead. me tell you why. Yeah. China has never been to the moon. They're planning to go to the moon for the first time in 2030. China. Why would it take China till 2030 to go to the moon? Why haven't we been back there a second time? Why hasn't anyone else been to the moon? Anybody got any answers? Well, I, I could tell you that today, as a matter of fact, Japan landed on the moon. Oh, fuck. That's a fact. Okay, I just got destroyed. <laughs> okay, but yeah. you think we... Why do you think we did? Because I don't think I, we did. I, I do. I but was, I wasn't alive when it happened. I was so alive. I, I heard you. it. I saw it. I, I don't know how they would create such a an effect in 1969. Stanley Ooh. Kubrick. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole thing. Well... Ah. Yeah, the China so, thing got me because I I said if China is only planning to go there in 2030, and you're trying to tell me that our dumbasses went there and when? 60s? 1969. 1969. And if you look at like all the other, why haven't we been back then? They say they, you know they, we didn't have to go back again because we've been there. <laughs> what so the fuck? We want to go further than the moon. Oh. We'll build a program to go further than the moon to Mars. When you want to lift off from the moon, then to go to I, Mars? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what Elon. I can't plans. get into the technical yeah, stuff. <laughs> it's just like, uh, you know, we're dealing with anti gravity, and I'm thinking what it might be like up there is if I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, like I said, you start pulling at those strings, and there's a lot of questions like, you know, you know that the original film was deleted they they yeah. recorded over the film of the moon landing so everything that we have is not an original it's a copy so you can't do the forensics on a copy of something but you could do the forensics on the original but nasa but they did would, that to better the quality is that right recording over it no they no. they recorded over it like hey we're filming another show let's record i mean now it's all digital but <laughs> right. when they had finite space on film nasa decided that it was worth recording over that like my mom didn't even record over like our christmas videos from when i was three like how is nasa not able to so nasa that? doesn't have the original film no and i've seen nasa Are officials sure? yeah wow and i've seen nasa nasa officials uh, and that's their explanation is they it's like oh we we just recorded over it um i've seen nasa officials why didn't we go back they say we lost the technology like we just lost all the books and all the work and all the calculus that we did to get there. We we lost the technology. And then you look at the uh, the the machinery that they use to make the the landing, and it's like it looks like gold tin foil on the outside as the the thermal barrier. And there's other questions like why can't we just zoom in with our phones and all these abilities that we have? Why can't we just zoom in from a really expensive telescope? and see rover tracks or anything like that. And you see pictures, and they give you pictures, and they're produced by NASA, but like that's one one of my buddies uh, in the chat, like I said, we were talking about earlier today, one of the naysayers, who's like, well, here's a picture from NASA. I was like, oh, how convenient. NASA came up with a picture to corroborate their story. Okay, we could we could trust that. Let's trust OJ, too. Um, <laughs> they, you know, like all these things that just don't make sense. And if you just want to follow the main narrative, then okay. Like they simultaneously, there's a record of uh, you know Nixon talking with um, the the astronauts who were up there, and he's watching video in real time that they supposedly broadcast with audio, and maybe there was some delay and some latency, but it was enough to get relatively real time video and audio from the moon without any you know satellites or anything that are you know rebroadcasting that and boosting the signal to get out like it's just weird stuff whereas you just tell an entire generation of people what happened they all believe it they've got no reason not to but when you look at it and they i've got a picture on my phone of stanley kubrick walking with a couple of uh nasa guys it's like 1965 stanley kubrick a famous uh sci-fi writer two NASA guys, and then some other guys, they're all walking together in 1965. And Stanley Kubrick was like the cutting edge of cinematography and creating film and all sorts of stuff. There's stuff where people pull up, you know, how there's there's only one light source when they're taking the pictures and videos on the moon, but there's shadows being cast in different directions. And they're like, okay, well, if 
there's only one sun up there. Do they bring out a bunch of camera equipment and they have a light studio set up on the moon? Because how do we have shadows that are going this way and that way like it's on a film set with multiple lighting source? It's just there's a lot of questions that I can't answer. And that's why I, like I said, I'll subscribe to both. I'm not making any life decisions yeah. based on entertaining conspiracy theories, but I at least make myself aware of these other perspectives that people are because it's you'd have to assume that everybody else that perpetuates these things is an idiot. What does the raw data tell you? I No opinion, no conspiracy, just raw data. What does it tell you? Based on what I've seen and the things I've read about the other actions that the government, ha- all governments and, and companies and people in power, I, I think there's a high probability that it was faked. Um, in 1980, if you said that aliens existed, you're a crazy person and people won't let their kids come and hang out with Uncle Tommy anymore. He yeah, said he yeah, had an experience. Tommy needs to go to Phil Haven. <laughs> but now, now in 2024, we've got the government saying, yeah, we've got craft. Yeah. And nobody cares. Everybody's yeah. like, oh, okay. They release it a little bit at a time. Yeah. And I've seen what they do is like a lot of times they'll trump it up like, oh, this is going to be released. We're expecting this. And then it's this. So then the next time there's something else being released, it's always, eh, yeah, I know. they Didn't they release something like that already? And they just bombard it with something else. Oh, and then after that, oh, Hunter Biden this, and oh, there's immigrants attacking people, and oh, this is dangerous, this is dangerous. So you get it in these massive doses with all these other things. So it's easier to get it in your brain, and this stuff doesn't even come up at the the, the water cooler anymore because they just hit it with so yeah. many other topics. We're just burnt out and just- I'm with you. My I say the probability is that we didn't, but I've, I'm not, who knows, you know? I don't think we did, but I have an open mind. But the but what sealed me was that China hasn't been there. We haven't been back. And to say that there's no reason to go back is nuts. But I know they said that. I know. Yeah, the excuses and so explanations don't make sense. I lean toward we didn't go pretty high, but I you know, I'm still open minded. But then when I, f- I forget who it was, but we played the nuclear bomb in like the forties mm-hmm. when they did that. And was that fake too? <laughs> if you were sitting there, you would quite even no, you would have questioned it. I don't think it was fake. Well, when they did it, there was a fucking car right there, and then all of a sudden, there's no car, and then the the camera had to have been right there. This whole thing blow. You had to see it. I mean, you had to be there for that one. No, and I don't know. No thanks. <laughs> yeah, it was an airdrop clip, but I mean, I don't know. It's it, just so fucking. And if you if you look at the other metrics, we're in. You know. Uh, it was like the Cold War era where we're, you know, our major competitors, the Soviets, and they're the devil. If you look at all the other metrics for the space race, they beat us with everything. They got the first satellites up there. They got the first low Earth, uh, low Earth orbit, orbit. Uh, they got the first man, uh, you know, in, into low Earth, Earth orbit, first dog. Everything else they beat us on. And then the one thing that mattered the most was the one that all of a sudden we jumped ahead and got there first. It, it like I said, that could be one of the explanations. Is is like, man, these um, Americans, we really need a like a win, much like you know being victorious in a world war. We need a new generational win, like something to be like, yeah, we're number one, and we're still the best. That could be one of the reasons. Well, that's why Kennedy made that promise. He, you know. In 1960, that's right. In 1960, he said we'll be to the moon by the end of the yeah. decade. So, yeah. the country went to work on well, his no. words. I, I think that that's it, where I. It doesn't that have to open. be a ne- nefarious reason. It could be, yeah. you know, for for jingoism and just right. like national yeah. pride. But then it's still the question of well, if they can pull that lie off and they're willing to for so many years, what else? Could but they pull because off? Kennedy said it. I I still think maybe, but I lean toward no. But what I do lean toward no is well, this UFO. It happened shit. after he died, so it's not like he verified it. Right. So he, he said we were going to do it, but then it happens after he died, so it's not like we have to trust the validity of it happening based on our trust of Kennedy. Um, because I mean, he was, he it was, was Nixon gone. who was in president. By the, you but, know, who I should ask. Roger Stone was here a month and a half yeah. ago. I should have asked him. He's got Nixon all over his back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got we, him back. and I made up. We're buddies again. Yeah. And I, yeah, he's whew, he's he's a character. He's a character. He's he's and he's been he's been right there for so many historical yeah. moments ever since he was like in his twenties. He wanted to come in on uh, the JFK anniversary. 
because he just got it all down. You know, I fucking should have asked him about the moon then, because he was Nixon, 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 Nixon. I'm sure he's pretty straight to an extent. It'd be I, interesting to 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 hear what I'll his, ask him. his knowledge base has. I'll get it. I'll get his ass in just for that. So hey. get get the fuck in just for one thing. Lock the door. Yeah. <laughs> but the UFO thing, as bad as I want it to be true, give me a piece. Give me a fucking piece, right? Well, Until I have a piece. I always believe, sorry, I always believe that there's something somewhere. So it has to be. We can't be the only living, breathing piece of whatever right. rock on uh, anywhere in the solar system. Yeah. Can't be. No way. Can't be. No way. Yeah, the no statistical way. probability is as much as we want to think that we're special and we're the most advanced. But you know what I always, I always say with this? And I'm the biggest UFO guy on the planet. I mean, fucking, I have I went on my astro... You know how many astrophysics yeah. I had in a row? Might as well have just been a space podcast for two months because I wanted to know. And not one... The top, the, whoever is the top, whoever is the second, I pay, had them in. Nobody has a piece of anything. Nobody saw a piece of anything. And then I go back to... If you can fucking bend time, because the only way you're going to get here is bend time, yeah. right? What are you going to do? You're going to figure out how to bend time, and then what? You get to Earth and you crash? Like, really? I've heard, I've heard a lot of... Uh... I mean, to me, that's insane. You can bend time and go trillions of light years, probably. You know what I mean? If not trillions, close to it. So you're able to do that. But then you're going to get to Earth, and you obviously know that there's gravity, and what, the fucking thing crashes? And nobody has a piece. No one. Well, I've, I've, heard, I've, I've heard some guys propose some interesting explanations on the crashes because, like you said, if they're that advanced, like how is it, are they running out of fuel? Like where was the gas station between here and fuel. wherever they came from? But if you think like, okay, you maybe there's... Say that there's, to them, like, did you run out of fuel? They'd be like, we just came here to end you, stupid fucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, if, if you, like, one example Something would be... Happened. Got it, hit by a rock. There's multiple different types of alien species. Some are working with us. Some are working against us. Maybe some gave us some kind of capability to knock the other ones down. Maybe it was one of them hitting one of their adversaries with an EMP or something that knocks them down. So that could explain the crashes. Um, and then some of the official okay, go guys. to the crashes, right? Everybody talks. Everybody talks. No matter what, at some point in time, sooner or later, somebody talks. Where's the piece? It's all talk. I saw, I heard, I read, I was told. Where's the proof? Nothing. Not one bit. Now, I know I 100% think they're out there. I mean, no doubt about it. But if they are here, I think they're here and we just can't see them. But I do not think that they're just flying in and fucking crashing and somehow everybody got every single piece of it and took it away really quick and then nobody escaped and blabbed their mouth other than Bob Lazar and a whistleblower. I mean, it's just, I don't believe it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I think um, a lot of it, there'll be, I think there there could be explanations that, you know, we haven't proposed that haven't been offered to us. I think a lot of it is like so abstract to us that it's too hard to answer the questions that we have. And the answers might actually be much more simple than what we can come up with. Um, I know one of the claims that uh, Dr. Stephen Greer made at yeah. the end of his uh, the documentary he released in June, a little after he was on your podcast. At the end, he said that there was an event like I think in the 80s where there was an alien interaction and they said, we're a future version of you. So they're coming back, or at least a, a type of them is a future evolution of us coming back, probably not trying to interfere too much with the, the timeline because we all know like the butterfly effect and the grandfather paradox. You change too much and, you know, it, it ruins the future. Like you kill your, you go back in time, kill your grandfather, and now you don't exist. So... There's that aspect where, if okay, if they are from the future, maybe they knew when those crashes were going to happen. Maybe, you know, the government, maybe there was monitoring going on at that time. And like I said, if I'm, you know, the aliens are working with us, they give us a call. Hey, uh, one of them just went down over here. Like, send some units there, clean up the area, 
disappear some people or white memories, men in black style or whatever else. Because if we're dealing with technology that's really that far advanced, what else did we have? Or what else do they have that maybe they've given us that is just something that is science fiction to us? And then they, and they put it out in media. So we're like, oh, like men in black, the mind eraser thing. Come on, man, you're crazy. But like I said, if we were talking about aliens in 1988, we'd be, you know, blacklisted. Yeah. Believe it or not, Greer probably, Greer, I mean, you know Hoffman's my number one. And I've, I've, I've heard stuff on Greer where he's like a uh, misinformation agent putting out, you know, fake, you know, alien stuff trying to divert us. I've even heard theories where like string theory is like there's so many flaws in string theory, but yeah. it was created just to like distract people and get, you know, uh, people going down the wrong uh the red herring of well, a rabbit hole. Well, Maku came up with string theory. String theory. Maku. That, that's who came up with that. And he's he's a tough guy, but I, I don't think he did that. I think he, that's I think that was actually his theory with, uh, what's the guy who passed away? He was actually on, on Epstein's flight list. Oh, uh, the guy, Hawking? Hawking, yeah. Him and, and Hawking. They had, Hawking and Maku had come up with string theory. But with Greer... You know, a lot of people think he's a kook and all that. But, again, same thing with him. Okay. I mean, he had document after document after document because his dad worked on the first spaceship that went to outer space. So you could see how he would have an in to get documents because his father built the first spaceship. But, again, you know, he has all, all this shit, all this shit. Okay, do you have any proof? Not papers, not you told. No, he doesn't. But what did make sense to me at least, was that he, his overall opinion after all the shit was that he thought that what we're seeing now is a civilization that was here. He thinks it's a civilization that built the pyramids and all that and that they were 100,000 years more advanced. We're at 2024. So imagine 100,000, 2,000, whatever, 24, right? So you have all that time. So what he thinks is that a meteor was coming. They knew it. They were able to get out of here, teleport. They were that advanced with vibration and all this shit. Sounds nuts, but reasonable. If you have 100,000 years, okay, and you get out, now they, you know, they're on another planet. Now we re-civilize. It takes forever to happen. And now when they, that they're coming back, and the reason why some of this shit is seen over, Nuclear sites is because if we set off a nuclear bomb, that goes into space and then that fucks up their time, like bending the time and everything else. So he was saying that some of the shit that you see is real, that they're coming looking over the nuke sites because it will fuck up their time travel. And then the other bit of it is ours or another country and just hiding it, testing it. Yeah. You know, this and that, which makes sense. And then he thought that octopuses were aliens, which I pretty much agree with that one, and about Antarctica, how nobody can fly over Antarctica. No one. No one can fly over there. No one can go there. No one can do anything. Yeah, very restricted. So what the fuck is going on back there? And this is where it gets kooky. You know, he thinks that there's shit back there and something's going on, but then... What are you doing over there, Scott? You know, what are you doing, Casey, in Antarctica that no one can go there? You know. Are you familiar with uh, Admiral Byrd? I don't. Decades think... and decades ago. You uh, know him? I, yeah. I think, yeah. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was a uh, post World War. Um, they they were doing Antarctic expeditions. They had special machinery for the military to go out there. These like uh, all terrain vehicles, specifically for ice, massive tires, huge endeavor to explore Antarctica. He came back, and there's multiple interviews where he came back, and he's got a journal and everything uh, uh, just documenting all of this, and he said they encountered other beings there, and there's all sorts of crazy stuff. Really? Might be a crazy dude, but this crazy dude made it to, like, the top of, I guess, the Navy, if he was an admiral. I mean, that's not a small thing. He's not just, like, some foot soldier. So he had a pretty pristine career. He was definitely down there, and then... To what gain did he decide at you know the twilight years of his of his life to go out and just divulge all this stuff that also corroborated the journal that he was documenting in real time back then? So decades later, he decides to come out with all this stuff. So it's like hmm. 
when you see people with that kind of credibility that would have been there and would have had access to these things, these, these aren't like secondhand people like Greer who wasn't there, but he's hearing it from trusted this sources. This guy and that guy. And we right. got, you know, he can't expose his sources, which is a good story. I understand that as well. But then there's also some like, eh, maybe, but someone like that. And then there's lots of documentation that uh, during World War Two, the Nazis were doing a lot. And I think probably even before that, the Nazis were down in Antarctica. And it's just so weird to think we can't go there. Why are you protecting the ice? You know, it's, you can go there, but it's like through approved things, super expensive oh, and you're shit. limited to going here. You limited, can't just yeah, no matter what. go gallivanting around. What was that guy's reputation as far as you're concerned that you had heard? Well, back at the time, everybody was like, okay, this guy's for real. I mean, he's an admiral. Why would you not believe him? I mean, so that was my perspective at the time. Guys tell the truth. Still is. I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it kind of adds up. I don't know. I've never been there, so I can't tell yeah. you. But I mean, an admiral, right? I mean, and back then, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, but back then, I don't think people were making up shit like they are nowadays. Yeah, they weren't uh, trying to, to go game, viral. Right? Yeah. No. Not an admiral back in those no, days. No, no, You no. said the 50s? Probably 50s, 60s, early 60s. Okay, so for people who are watching and listening, Scott, I mean, in case you know too, you know, back then you didn't do that kind of shit. If you're an admiral, that's like, you know, now an admiral is, <laughs> who knows how they respect it. But back then, that was the shit, right? Yep. Okay. So for that kind of guy, he wouldn't even have it in his blood to, to lie like that. Am I right? I, I would doubt it. I mean, that would be that. I'm like thinking like my grandpa, hard ass motherfucker, yeah. hard dude. No nonsense. No, no nonsense. Doesn't take any shit. And on his way out, he would have been the type that would have been like, "Hey, this is what's going on. I'm out." You know? Yeah. It's 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 interesting. His his uh, depiction of it was very far fetched with like hollow earth and these tall like. Aryan blonde beings like humanoids and uh, I, there was a airship that they were flying around and it took down one of our military air fit, airships that was like surveying the area and it basically showed like we've got weapons and capabilities that are beyond anything you can e even fathom we're peaceful we're not here to mess with you come on check out our place and supposedly they took them down uh, inside you know, hollow earth and crazy, crazy movie level stuff. And this was all in his journal? Yeah. And wow. and stuff that he's done. There's wow. videos you can pull up where he's done interviews depicting this stuff. And it's just like, okay, kind of like I'm going to file that back and not think about that day to day because it might start unraveling everything. But it's it's weird, weird stuff. So it's not just a bunch of guys with tinfoiled hats. Oh, I didn't know that. You know? I never knew about that. Wow. I believe the Admiral. Yeah. All right, now I'm switching so, to the Admiral. So he died in 57. It's a, so it was he, not, Yeah, he died in 1957. Yeah. Okay. So, so it was the 50s, you know, like, you know. Yeah. So I was a kid, little kid. I mean, you know, I heard about it, I read about it, and, you know, they taught us whatever, but I don't think it was it wasn't a conspiracy. Nobody you didn't have the internet, you didn't have right, a conspiracy. Right. You didn't that, fabricate shit back you, then. You had to no, learn an Admiral. Well, you believe it. it. You believe it, you right? You believe it. And and an Admiral as far as I'm in the field, which just wouldn't lie. I mean, they just wouldn't. I mean, now they would lie about anything, I'm sure. But back then, hell no. Wow, that changes things. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's where my, I just changed my mind again. <laughs> and the way I think about it is. You can't deny that one. It, it's, it definitely lends a lot of weight Ooh. and credibility to, you know, that perspective. And, and the way I, I think of things is, you know, if we were two dimensional beings and we lived on a piece of paper and everything we knew existed on that piece of paper and all the limitations that we had as two-dimensional beings were confined to that piece of paper me coming in as a three-dimensional being and telling you like no it's not just that way this way this way and this way you can go that way as well right. i can jump from this side of the paper to that side of the paper instantaneously it would seem magic it, it magical it seems sci-fi it seems so far-fetched but to us it's just oh yeah that's just how we that's just how we can do it on this plane we have this ability so you know that famous quote any uh, advanced enough any advanced enough technology is indistinguishable from from magic you go back in time with you know a lighter during the stone age and you're yeah. a god you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. like what the fuck and then anybody Ooh. telling that story secondhand like yeah this guy just came out and he 
did this and there was fire. Remember that, you know, that stuff we have to rub sticks together for hours to get? This guy just does it like that. He's a god. And then everybody prayed to him. And it's going to be like, oh, come on, you've yeah. been hit on the head a little bit too much. Yeah. You know, hey, you're a little crazy. So it's exactly right, man. You know, it's that's an easy explanation for a lot of this stuff that breaks our rules of physics and everything else that we've been taught. You know, we can't go faster than the speed of light. What if we're not traveling across the paper and limited to the speed of light? What if we're using a wormhole or uh, I think I mentioned to you in one of our texts, like the uh, they call it uh, like uh, super cavitation or hyper cavitation that they use for missiles um, in uh, for submarine warfare, where it basically creates an air pocket around the, the torpedo, not missile, around the torpedo. So it's able to go faster through the water because it's not not subjected to the drag coefficient of water. So it's kind of finding a pocket in between this restrictive reality that is water. So if we, we were to able it's almost to... almost like, do, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like an air bubble yeah. that goes a long way and they find that air bubble and... So now there's no friction, no so now friction. it goes faster. Yep. So now if these spacecraft are able to move through the atmosphere at speeds that would otherwise be melting the metal that we know about, aside from having advanced metallurgy that's super conductive or whatever else, creating some kind of a pocket in this reality. With all the debris and everything else, yep, you go right and there. And now you're just no longer subjected to reality because it doesn't feel like you're moving. You're kind of outside the pocket of time and you're able to go from here to here at like that and make 90 degree turns where you know they have these crafts doing this stuff and blasting off and accelerating without any Propulsion. emissions no heat signatures yeah. and it's because they're using something other than our what we think is super advanced but to them it's rudimentary technology right like a battery yeah. <laughs> you know, like a battery like a tesla battery yeah, yeah. like uh, uh bob lazar even talked about you know element 115 yeah. what can that be used to to you know manipulate gravity and if you can manipulate gravity in ways that we can't even fathom because we don't know, we don't have a relationship with gravity like that, what can you do with that? You create a gravitational force in front of you that pulls your vehicle in. Now you're not using propulsion. You're basically using gravity to fall forward and you just turn that up to fall forward faster. And it's weird, weird stuff. And him, man, if if he's lying, he's the best liar that ever lived. Because do you remember him on Barbara Walters in the 70s? Bob Lazar? He he came out and and said and in whenever he left there fifty nine sixty one I I forget whenever Bart maybe it was a little bit later but he kept the same story for fifty some years now and when, when people would ask him where's the proof he didn't have the proof at the time yeah. but later he did show up in an MIT book which yeah. MIT said he was never there he yeah, did show up in the Rolodex yeah. for the Area fifty one they tried to delete him everywhere and the only one I found that they could verify was that he went to MIT and. Scott, it was one newspaper article. It was the graduating class, and it was in like a, you know, one of the, the newspapers that they throw up. They used to throw on your porch. Nobody read it. It just had yeah. a bunch of food coupons in. Yeah, like a student. Yeah, student everybody just throws the fuck away yeah. to get off their sidewalk. Well, it was in that, and they forgot that one, and they could trace it back that he really was there and everything else. And he even said, he goes, "Look, I don't know if it's from another planet." But I do know that we don't have this on Earth that's known. So he was very legitimate with what he had said. But a lot of shit going on, man. Yeah. All right, Casey. Well, hey, man, whenever you have time, shoot back up. Always a great conversation. And if you want to do more podcasts, let me know. Looking forward Easy. to it, man. Definitely. Always a pleasure. And go to uh, Meal Prep 101. That's meal a prep, good idea, man. Mealprepbiz101.com. Really... Yes. And I'm also all over YouTube if you look up Meal Prep. And your Instagram? Instagram, I, I've neglected, but uh, pretty much the, the site is where you can reach out to me. I've got private groups and all sorts of different resources, the one-on-one -on -one consultations, marketing help, software, all that jazz, a uh, bunch of hundreds of videos on YouTube as well. If you look up Meal Prep Biz 101. Um, and Meal Prep Biz out. 101 on YouTube. And if somebody wants to call to get, like, quotes, they just email? Or yeah, they do? all, all like, on the site. Um, you can... Fill out a form uh, for anything that you're interested in. I've got a, a portal that has, you know, like I said, the memberships, uh, boot camps. You could book a consultation, all that jazz. Awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I always Scott, do. who's going to win the Super Bowl? You got to be kidding me. I, I like the 49ers. 49ers? 49ers.
Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. Your Giants, I don't know what to – I don't know. They suck. But they beat the Eagles. <laughs> but everybody beat That's the Eagles. You can't figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're playing – I think those refs 1,000% are playing the under over. A thousand percent. Well, especially this year. You can't figure it out. That's why they have all these betting sites. (laughs) They can figure it out. They know they're going to win. Just look at the under over and watch the calls. (laughs) That's right. That's it, man. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thanks so much, Casey. It was great, man. Thank you. Thank you.